How about a mysterious object that used to orbit between Mars and Jupiter? At one point in the early days of the solar system, it was destroyed by some catastrophic event. The space body is called Phaeton, and this planet is totally hypothetical. But some people believe that the debris the planet left behind could have formed the asteroid belt. If you like this kind of content, please give it a non-hypothetical like and subscribe. Your support is very important to us. Thank you. Now, at the start of the 19th century, people hadn't discovered the asteroid belt yet. But in 1801, one astronomer spotted the largest asteroid in our solar system, Ceres. At that time, it was believed that a planet was orbiting between Mars and Jupiter, and Ceres seemed to be a suitable candidate. But the next year, another astronomer discovered one more space object with a similar orbit. It was an asteroid that was later named Pallas. These discoveries made scientists conclude that these two objects could have been fragments of the very planet that had once been dwelling between Mars and Jupiter. The following discovery of two more asteroids, Juno and Vesta, seemed to confirm this idea. Only in the 20th century did the hypothetical planet get its name, Phaeton. It was actually a name taken from Greek mythology, meaning Shining One. The hero with this name was the son of the sun deity, Helios, who rode his solar chariot across the sky every day, giving humans the heat and light necessary for survival. One day, Helios allowed Phaeton to drive his chariot. But the sun didn't manage to control the horses. Everything went wrong, and Earth was about to burn down. That's why the main deity, Zeus, had to stop Phaeton with a thunderbolt. The idea of the asteroid belt being the sad result of the planet's destruction was called the disruption theory. And of course, there were several ideas explaining the planet's tragic fate. The most obvious one is that Phaeton was hit by a large space object. It could be another hypothetical body called Nemesis. Some people believe that it's our sun's companion star. According to this theory, the sun has a small companion star that has an extremely elliptical orbit. This orbit periodically brings it close to the Oort cloud, a large sphere of icy objects surrounding the sun. This, in turn, causes a lot of mess. It might be the reason why this hypothetical companion star was also nicknamed the Death Star. It might be a red or brown dwarf. But whatever it is at the furthest point of its orbit, it's believed to be about 1.5 light years away. The search for this star has been in progress for decades. But no one has succeeded in locating this elusive and potentially non-existent space object. Anyway, back to Phaeton. Another theory claims that the planet could have suffered some internal cataclysm which tore it apart. But these days, the disruption theory has fallen out of favor. It was replaced by the accretion theory. According to it, the asteroid belt formed in the process of gradual buildup of particles initially floating in a gaseous environment. With time, they came together to create larger masses. Gravity pulled on these particles, encouraging them to stay together and form planetesimals, tiny planet-like bodies that later form real planets. Planetesimals kept colliding with one another, eventually developing into protoplanets. Such protoplanets grow until they form planetary bodies. As the mass of objects increases, the gravitational forces acting between particles become stronger too, continuing to build gas, dust, and ice within the nebular disk. It all has a snowball effect where the increase in mass results in more particles getting involved in the process. Eventually, there's no building material left, and large space objects float in the darkness of space. Now, many experts think that the asteroid belt is the remains of the protoplanetary disk which had once been orbiting the Sun before the planets formed. Unfortunately, it never had a chance to coalesce into a planet because Jupiter's gravitational effect prevented it from happening. In any case, even though Phaeton's was a good story, it's not popular anymore. Dark, mysterious, cold space. Comets, asteroids, planets, stars, and something that's lurking over there, far beyond Pluto. Yup, this could be the ninth planet of our solar system, the one people have been wondering about for centuries. IRAs, which stands for the Infrared Astronomical Satellite, collected interesting data back in 1983. 
it could be proof that Planet 9 is hiding there. No one knows if it really exists, but this discovery helped to build a model to understand this potential planet better. And in 2016, scientists found out that some small space objects in the Kuiper Belt were orbiting a bit oddly. The Kuiper Belt is the outer area of our solar system. It's a ring in the shape of a donut, filled with leftovers from the times when our solar system was forming. You can find this donut beyond Neptune. The objects in that region of space have weird orbits, almost as if a big body with strong gravity is pushing them away. Knock knock, Planet 9 again! The theory says it might be 5 to 10 times the mass of our own planet, and up to 20 times further away than Neptune. The astronomical unit equals the distance between our planet and the Sun. Pluto is approximately 40 astronomical units from the Sun. But Planet 9, if it exists, is 400 to 800 astronomical units away. It would take 10,000 to 20,000 Earth years for this mysterious planet to make a single circle around the Sun. This makes it harder for us to catch the space body. There's a theory Planet 9 may have formed between the orbits of Jupiter and Neptune, similar to the rest of the gas giants in our solar system. The gravitational force of one of the two huge planets probably kicked it out of its orbit. Oh no! Then Planet 9 could get ejected further away from the eight planets we know about. It ended up as some sort of icy waste, quite small at the beginning. But as time went by, Planet 9 has cleared its orbit of frozen pieces of rock and dust and finally formed into a real planet. Another theory says that this could be a planet another star lost on its way while it was passing near our solar system. In any case, Planet 9 probably doesn't reflect that much sunlight since it's so far away. And astronomers aren't sure where exactly they should look for it. Space is dark, mysterious, endless, obviously. But if we do find Planet 9, it will be the first solid proof there are more planets in our solar system than we thought. Moving on to an interesting exoplanet, located only 90 light years away from us. An exoplanet is generally a planet located outside our solar system. This one has an atmosphere with water clouds. One year there lasts 24 Earth days, and the planet travels around a red dwarf star, which is way dimmer and smaller than our sun. That's why, even though the planet is 8 times closer to its star than we are to our sun, the temperature there is similar to that on our planet. This exoplanet has a size similar to Neptune. It's also less dense, which means it's mostly made of gas, unlike Earth, which is made of rock. The average temperatures there is 140 degrees, which makes it one of the coolest small exoplanets we've ever discovered. And the cooler the exoplanet is, the bigger the chance we'll find clouds in its atmosphere. Researchers have discovered more than 4,000 exoplanets. But all of them have been found within the Milky Way, at least until now. For the first time, astronomers may have spotted a planet outside our galaxy. They called it M51 ULS 1. Hmm. The planet is located in the Whirlpool Galaxy, a distant spiral galaxy 28 million light years away from us. There was once a huge but pretty young star that got stuck in a gravitational dance with something that could be a dense neutron star, the collapsed core of a giant star, or a black hole. The star's dance partner had incredibly strong gravity. It was feeding on the star, greedily ripping away its plasma. Then something unusual happened. An unknown, maybe even Saturn-sized object passed by and blocked this confrontation from our solar system. Now no one can see what is going on. But this could potentially be the farthest planet we've ever discovered. There's a newly discovered planet outside our solar system. As large as Jupiter, it orbits two stars. And, as we can observe it from our planet, it crosses in front of them both. The full circle around these two stars, which means one year, takes approximately 200 Earth days. On the day of the discovery of the previous planet, scientists also found it had an unusual companion. It's an extra-hot Jupiter with an ultra-tight orbit around its star. The year there lasts only 1.9 Earth days. This planet has a weirdly shaped orbit. Also, it travels in the opposite direction from the rotation of its star. If you could travel 57 light years away from our planet, you'd see something pink lurking in the darkness. As you get closer, it becomes bigger and more fascinating. Yup, it's a magenta-colored planet. A few billion miles away from its sun, this guy is one of the youngest planets scientists have discovered. It's only 100 to 200 million years old. 
It's made of pink gas, similar to our Jupiter. So if you could fly closer to its surface, this gas would envelop you like a thick fog. You're coming closer and going deeper, and the gas is becoming darker, getting a reddish shade. And look at the planet's core. It's super hot. Because of its high temperature of 460 degrees Fahrenheit, this planet is like an oven. The heat is the reason the planet glows so brightly. You'll also notice the sky is hazy pink, with clouds made of droplets of frozen water, similar to ours. There's another exoplanet half as massive as Earth, which is one of the smallest planets we've ever found outside our solar system. It has a diameter of 5,600 miles. For comparison, Earth's diameter is 7,900 miles. The planet in question is mostly made of iron, similar to Mercury. Mercury has a massive iron core and a very thin crust, which makes it an oddball in our solar system. At its early stages, it collided with some space body at least once. That collision pulled its outer layers away, which is why only the firm iron core remained. Maybe this exoplanet participated in a huge space crash too. That's what probably took away the planet's mantle and left mostly its iron core. Or maybe this is just a remnant of a gaseous planet that used to be the size of Neptune. The atmosphere of the planet could be blown away by, let's say, a huge amount of radiation coming from the star. This planet is only 31 light years away from us, and the day there is less than 8 Earth hours long. The planet is only a little bit bigger than Mars. People aren't likely to ever settle in that place because of its extreme temperatures that go up to 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. There might even be molten lava on the side of the planet that faces its star. Such temperatures are high enough to evaporate any atmosphere, so this planet might have had one in the past. Generally, gas giants like Jupiter can't support life because they have extreme weather conditions, temperature, and pressure. And there are no building blocks that might create life. But smaller terrestrial planets, such as, I don't know, Earth, have more key ingredients like oxygen and liquid water. Plus, they have more temperate weather and other conditions. And still, not all of such planets support life, of course. It's not easy to find a planet with similar conditions as the ones we have on Earth, or at least the conditions that would allow life to develop there. But meet Kepler-22b, one of our most promising findings. It's 600 light-years away from us, twice bigger than our planet, and with temperatures of about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a so-called super-Earth. It's a category of planets unlike any we have in the solar system. They're more massive than Earth, but still lighter than ice giants such as Uranus or Neptune. Super-Earths can consist of rock, gas, or a mixture of these two. Kepler-22b is within the habitable zone of its parent star, which is less bright than our sun. The planet probably has a rocky core. It may have an ocean, but it doesn't host any life. At least, we don't know about it yet. While we may think of ourselves as advanced after catching a glimpse of the eight planets of our solar system and their 200 moons, we really have little idea of what's out there. So much so that there's speculation that there might be one more planet in our solar system. Scientists call it Planet X or Planet 9. This undiscovered world could be hidden way out past Neptune. Asteroids and dwarf planets in this area have weirdly unexplained altered orbits, and Planet X may be the reason. Tales of this mysterious planet began over a hundred years ago with a man called Percival Lowell. Lowell had a great love of space, and aside from having an impressive mustache, he was also super rich. Ooh, that lucky guy. He used his riches to build an observatory in Arizona. He then dedicated it to study the odd motions of Uranus and Neptune. Their gravitational pulls are slower than those of all the other planets in our solar system, almost as if there is a giant hidden object pulling them off course. In 1906, Lowell theorized that there could be another planet out beyond Neptune. It probably caused those strange cosmic happenings. The man called this potential space body Planet X. In 1930, Pluto was discovered by Clyde Tombaugh at Lowell's very own observatory. It finally looked like people had an explanation for the weird orbital patterns. Lowell's team was on cloud 9 after the discovery, but their celebrations were short-lived. Soon, they found out that Pluto is way too small to be having that much of an effect on the surrounding planets. 
and it was also too far away from them. So it was back to the drawing board. Planet X, if it exists, is 10 times the size of Earth and 4 times its radius. It would take at least 10,000 years for the planet to orbit the Sun. And it would sit over 200 times further out than our home planet. That's 600 astronomical units from the center of the solar system. FYI, an astronomical unit equals the distance between the Earth and the Sun. But while that sounds super far away, it's actually not. The distance between space bodies is usually measured in light years, and an astronomical unit is a much smaller unit of measurement. For context, the most distant thing detected from Earth is the galaxy GNZ11. Cute name, huh? It sits a staggering 32 billion light years away. Even so, our telescopes can still spot it. And just one light year is the same as 63,241 astronomical units. Woo! So, if our tech can detect a galaxy that's so far away, how have we not been able to uncover Planet X? Well, it's probably down to the fact that it might not even exist. The theory of Planet X was pretty much debunked back in 1989. It was discovered that the mysterious gravitational pulls of Neptune had been a red herring all along. Scientists had massively misjudged just how big Neptune actually was. Voyager 2 visited the planet and discovered its actual size. This new info explained the odd gravitational pulls, meaning they weren't being caused by the so-called Planet X. But that's not where our investigation ends, as the hypothetical ninth planet once again popped up around 10 years ago. While the evidence behind Lowell's theory was wrong, his belief in Planet X may not have been. In 2015, astronomers Michael Brown and Konstantin Batigin discovered that there were, in fact, unexplained gravitational forces at play past Neptune. There are satellites that orbit planets perpendicularly, which doesn't happen anywhere else in our solar system. There's also clusters of asteroids that move in very specific ways. So specific that it's basically impossible that it could be random. Even weirder, there are satellites that travel in completely opposite direction to the Sun, unlike most other things in the solar system. A planetoid called Sedna also appears to be being pulled towards something, along with six others, all going in the same direction. And Brown and Batigin aren't just any other stargazers. They're both well-respected scientists at the top of their game. Konstantin Batigin has been named in Forbes as one of 30 scientists who are changing the world. And Mike Brown was the man who rebranded Pluto as a dwarf planet. This means that when these guys say something, it's usually pretty legit, and you should probably listen. But the only way we can really prove Planet X exists is to actually find it. And this has turned out to be pretty difficult. To locate the planet, we'd need to use a method called transit photometry. This is basically where we monitor a whole bunch of stars for a long time and look out for any dips in the light they give off. These dips would likely be caused by a planet getting in the way. And ta-da! The existence of Planet X could be proved. But for this method to work, Earth, the new planet, and the Sun all have to be perfectly aligned. These circumstances are pretty rare. And if these conditions don't exist, the dip in light won't happen. Plus, this method would only really work with planets that are closer to the Sun than our Earth. That's Venus and Mercury. For anything past Earth, this technique is pretty much useless. Another technique we could use is to find the potential planet through a good old-fashioned telescope. But as you can imagine, that's insanely tricky. The furthest object that we found in our solar system is a planetoid, appropriately named, far, far out. But that's only 140 AU away from the Sun. That's only like a quarter of the way to Planet X. We can only see an object because of its brightness. The Sun is very visible to us because it emits huge amounts of light. And we can see the Moon because it reflects the Sun's light. Technically, the Moon has no right to appear brighter than everything else in the night sky. It only seems brighter because we're closer to it. The farther away an object is, the less bright it appears to us. The major issue with seeing the theoretical Planet X is that all objects in our solar system get their light from the Sun. 
They reflect sunlight, and that's why we can see them. Given how far away from the sun Planet X might be, it makes it nearly impossible to see. And because of its really dim light, to view it, we would require perfect weather conditions as well as an extremely strong telescope. But Brown and Badigeon have found the perfect one. The Subaru Telescope is located at the top of a dormant volcano in Hawaii. It's huge and is capable of capturing even the weakest light from distant space objects. The issue that we need to figure out is where to point it. Without knowing where Planet X actually is, this basically turns things into a giant guessing game. There are also only around three nights every year when the conditions are clear enough to see the hypothetical Planet X. It's difficult, but not impossible. And still, most astronomers have called it a day and agreed that Planet X doesn't exist, stating that it's just a common myth. The most widespread explanation for the weird gravitational pulls is that there's a tiny black hole in our solar system. It's pulling the planets toward us. But don't worry. They say it's not big enough to actually munch on a planet. So Earth is all good, for now. The issue with the black hole theory is that, once again, it's almost impossible for us to track the thing down. While its mass could be as great as that of Planet X, the hole itself would be squished down to the size of an orange. Telescopes wouldn't be of any use. To find it, people would have to look for the gamma rays sent off by objects as they fall into the black hole. Another way we could find it is to release hundreds of tiny spacecraft. They would pass close enough to the hypothetical hole, and when they got pulled toward it, we could probably detect it. But don't count out Brown and Batigen's theory. It's still being documented by NASA. And until we find unmistakable evidence to prove any theories, Planet X might still be out there. 25 light years away from Earth, in the constellation Lyra, there's a young star, Vega. The brightest and one of the most famous, this star is twice the mass of our Sun. Vega is so brilliant, you can see it even at twilight when all the other stars disappear from the sky. Despite all the star's fame, astronomers have never seen a single planet orbiting Vega, until recently. Researchers have been observing the star for a decade or so when they spotted a curious signal. It might be Vega's first world we'll know about. If it did exist, it'd be a marvelous place. The planet would likely orbit so close to its host star that one day on it would last around two and a half Earth days. The world would be the size of Neptune, and this ice giant is four times wider than Earth. Or it might even be as large as Jupiter. But the most impressive thing about this potential planet would be its temperature. The place could turn out to be the second hottest world known to scientists. On its surface, it'd be as hot as 5400 degrees Fahrenheit. For comparison, the temperature on the surface of the hottest planet in the solar system, Venus, doesn't rise above 900 degrees Fahrenheit. The only place hotter than Vega's potential companion would be Kelt 9b. The temperatures on this exoplanet don't drop below 7,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Anyway, the candidate world would be closer to Vega than Mercury in our solar system is to the Sun. It could result in the giant planet puffing up like a balloon. And then, even metals would melt in its scorching hot atmosphere. Unfortunately, the existence of the sizzling planet has yet to be confirmed. Astronomers think that the easiest way to prove it is by trying to spot the light emitted by the unusual planet. And since we're talking about planets, are there any worlds out there that resemble Earth? Astronomers have discovered and confirmed more than 4,000 exoplanets, but it's no secret that thousands of other candidates are still waiting for their turn to be detected. Of course, not all of these planets are like our Earth, but some are. For example, Gliese 667 CC. This world is only 22 light years away from Earth. Scientists aren't sure if the planet is rocky, but they know the place is more than four times as massive as our planet. The star of Gliese 667 CC is a red dwarf. That's why it's much cooler than our sun. So the exoplanet is likely to be in its star's habitable zone. But this idea hasn't been confirmed yet. The Earth-like planet might be moving too close to the star. Then it can be regularly baked by its flames. Kepler 22b is much farther away than the previous world. If you wanted to reach that planet, 
you'd have to travel 600 light years. This world, which is more than twice as large as the Earth, lies in the habitable zone of its host star. But it's unclear whether it's liquid, gaseous, or rocky. Kepler 69c is almost 70% bigger than our planet. It's also very, very far away, 2,700 light years. It'd take you 54 million years to travel the distance that great in a modern spacecraft. Researchers aren't sure what Kepler 69c consists of, but they think it's likely to lie in the habitable zone. The planet's position in its solar system is like that of Venus and ours. But since the host star is only 80% as bright as the sun, the planet shouldn't be affected by its heat that greatly. Kepler 452b is the most Earth-like planet astronomers have discovered so far. It resides 1,400 light years away from our planet. Its host star is very similar to our sun, and the planet, lying in its habitable zone, is 1.5 times the size of Earth. Scientists also think that Kepler 425b is likely to be a rocky world. Are any of these or other planets besides Earth suitable for life? There are 24 potentially super habitable planets, and one of them met not one, but two criteria astronomers have for such worlds. KOI 5715.01 is five and a half billion years old and around twice the size of Earth. It orbits an orange dwarf a bit less than 3,000 light years away from our planet. Its surface temperature might be four degrees Fahrenheit cooler than that of Earth. But since the planet's atmosphere might have more heat-trapping gases, the place is likely to be super habitable. Another potential super habitable planet is KOI 5554.01. This world is a bit older than our planet, 6.5 billion years against our 4.5 billion. The exoplanet's size is likely to be the same as Earth's. The planet orbits its host star, a yellow dwarf, and the average temperature on its surface is 80 degrees Fahrenheit. What planets are visible from Earth? Mercury is the nearest to the Sun in our solar system. But since this planet is so close to the star, you can only see it just after sunrise, in the early morning and at dusk. From up close, the place looks a bit like the good old moon. The planet doesn't have an atmosphere, and the temperatures on its surface are extreme. 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit at night. Venus is the second brightest celestial object out there after the Moon. It's one of our planet's closest neighbors. Also, it's the most similar to Earth in terms of gravity, size, mass, and average density. Unfortunately, you won't be able to see Venus's surface from Earth. A thick layer of clouds is securely hiding the planet. Jupiter can be either the third or fourth brightest object in the sky. It depends on Mars, which occasionally shines brighter than the gas giant. You can see Jupiter especially well in the summer. The gas giant's most famous feature is the Great Red Spot. That's an enormous storm that has been raging on the planet's surface for centuries. Even though the largest planet in the solar system looks like a solid sphere, you wouldn't be able to land on its surface. Jupiter is mainly made up of gases, mostly helium and hydrogen. Saturn is the second largest planet in the solar system. It's the last one of the five planets you can see from Earth with the unaided eye. Saturn is incredibly far from Earth but its unique rings help you instantly recognize this colossal planet. It's a pity that Saturn's trademark feature is only visible in a telescope. By the way, more than 700 Earths would fit into Saturn. At the same time, the gas giant's density is a mere one-eighth of Earths. This is why Saturn's mass is just 95 times greater than that of our planet. What planets in the solar system are closer to each other than the rest? Astronomers believe that Mercury is the closest to any other planet in the solar system. And that's quite shocking because how about Venus? It orbits the Sun between Mercury and Earth. Isn't it supposed to be closer to our planet? Venus is indeed rather close to Earth, but only for a very short period in its orbit. The rest of the time, Venus is much farther away. But Mercury's orbit doesn't let the planet move too far away from the Sun, and it's closer to Earth more than 50% of the time. The same principle works with other planets, too. Even gas giant Neptune is farther from Uranus than from Mercury. Most of the time, the two larger planets are on the opposite sides of the solar system. Their orbits sometimes do bring them very close to each other, but it happens very rarely. And how about planets outside the solar system? Astronomers have recently discovered two worlds traveling around the same star. Their orbits are often so close to each other that each planet looks like a huge full moon from the surface of the other. 
It occurs every 97 Earth days. These planets are about 1,200 light years away from Earth. Their composition and size are different, but the distance between them is a mere 1.2 million miles. That's five times the distance between Earth and the Moon, and it's closer than any other planets astronomers know about. One of the newly found worlds is more than four times as massive as our Earth. It's likely to be rocky. The other is a gaseous planet the size of Neptune and almost eight times as massive as our planet. Scientists haven't figured out yet how such dramatically different space bodies ended up in such similar orbits. You're strapped in a spaceship that'll take you all the way to Pluto for your galaxy backpacking trip. It's the longest journey from Earth and without any shortcuts, so you'll have to get quite comfy. It's recommended for everyone aboard to have at least eight hours of sleep at night. Astronauts in the International Space Station have little rooms suitable for one person with special sleeping bags and enough room for personal belongings. If they don't, they'll float, bumping into each other. It's a good thing the journey to Pluto will only take you a few days, so you can manage to have your full eight hours of sleep for the rest of the trip. After a few days, you finally arrive at Pluto, and a bus takes you to the hotel. The dwarf planet is one of the darkest places in the solar system reflecting very little light since it's located far away from the sun. You look out the window and see some decent landscapes with mountain ranges around 10,000 feet high. But instead of your snowy peaks like in Switzerland, it's methane ice. You have a smartwatch that can tell you the atmosphere characteristics outside. Pluto is filled with nitrogen and methane. After a couple of hours, you finally make it to the hotel and check into your room. You're surprised that you booked one day only. One of the first things you'll notice is the weak gravity, which makes it pretty hard to sleep. Then, finally, after enjoying a full day, you're ready to hit the sack. But the day isn't technically over. A solar day, when the planet rotates around its own axis, needs around six Earth days. So your 12 hours of fun and exploration was like enjoying just an hour on Earth. If you think that's long, then don't bother waiting 248 years to celebrate New Year's. That's the time Pluto needs to orbit the Sun fully. After a while, your biological clock adjusts to conditions on Pluto, so you end up sleeping for more than 72 hours to feel fully refreshed. You check out the next day, Pluto's next day, and fly off to Neptune. This magnificent blue planet may seem appealing, but it's extremely dangerous. But why not? You like the adventure. You get a fantastic view of all the 14 moons of Neptune while waiting for room service. You're somewhat jet-lagged and decide to sleep for a few hours. Even though you chose to take a nap, you end up wasting the whole day doing nothing but nibbling on snacks in the buffet. A day lasts around 17 Earth hours. You were able to fall asleep and slept for about 10 hours, which is more than half a day. And just like Pluto, it takes more than 100 years for it to orbit the sun, 165 Earth years to be exact. After a while, you adjust your sleeping habits to just around three hours to enjoy the rest of your trip. You arrive at the largest planet in our solar system, Jupiter. After landing, you have to commute for another whole month before you come to your hotel. Don't worry, a full day is only about 10 hours. You check in and decide to stay in the hotel. It's not easy to go out since the weather is stormy. One of your programs includes a trip to the Great Red Spot, an area that's been tormented with hurricane-like storms for the past 300 years. The whole spot is twice the size of Earth. Jupiter could easily fit in 1,300 Earths. After a long couple of days enjoying the sights, you get back to the hotel and sleep it off. Since 10 hours is a full day, you're pretty tired and sleep off the entire day but you couldn't get a proper good night's rest since the gravity is stronger than Earth's. Also, it wasn't easy going to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Eventually, you got your two hours of sleep adjusting to Jupiter's conditions. Mars is a lot more scenic than the rest. You book a full day at Olympus Mons Volcano, which happens to be the highest mountain in the solar system. It's three times bigger than Everest. Your hotel has a beautiful view of the mountain, and is also the most luxurious and advanced one you've ever booked. The day is 25 hours long, quite similar to Earth's. It means you can get your regular eight hours of sleep. Sadly, 
Outside the dome, there's a mega dust storm that's covering the entire planet. As soon as it settles, you take a trip to the polar caps, which are covered in carbon dioxide snow caps. You can feel the temperature drop. Even though Mars is the red planet, it's pretty cold. It needs 687 days to orbit the sun. Your body is starting to feel the changes moving from planet to planet. In many places, you couldn't sleep well or slept in what appears to be an entire day, even though it was regular for you. On Mercury, you check in at an underground hotel that looks like an ant colony and immediately feel the heat coming from the sun. Mercury is the closest planet to the big guy, but Venus is still the hottest. This tiny planet needs 1,408 hours to finish an entire day, which is around 60 Earth days. It's a good thing you arrive during sunset. You have an epic view of the sunset, and as soon as the sun is completely gone, it gets really cold. Since Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere to trap heat, the cold takes over quickly. So you hibernate for a whole month before leaving. You arrive at Saturn, the ringed planet, and see the giant moons orbiting around it. Saturn only has 11 hours in a day. This planet is also extremely windy in the upper atmosphere. And on top of the fantastic view of the moons, you can't miss out on the rings. They're made out of ice and rock particles, ranging in all sizes from a grain of rice to the size of a boat. Billions of these particles are floating in the air, which scientists believe to be the remains of comets and dwarf planets. Next, you travel to Titan, Saturn's largest moon and the second largest moon in the solar system. According to scientists, Titan has the closest Earth-like conditions. It's just colder since it's further from the sun. Besides Earth, Titan is the only place in the solar system with liquid lakes, rivers, and oceans. Methane and ethane lakes are all over the place, so you get on a fabulous cruise around this moon. The atmosphere is also similar to that of Earth and has the right ingredients to start life. You look up at the sky and see clouds forming as it begins to rain. You hide under the shady part of the boat and wait for it to settle. Titan has a methane hydrological cycle pretty similar to the water cycle on Earth, meaning water first evaporates into the sky and then it starts raining. After the fantastic cruise tour, you go to some of the other moons and eventually back to Saturn. You're looking through all the pictures you took as you head back to Earth. The whole trip took you almost an entire Earth year and your body just can't adjust to Earth's conditions anymore. You were so used to sleeping and waking up in total darkness and, in some places, exposed to extreme sunlight. You've slept in different places with different gravity levels, so you don't know what it feels like to sleep on an actual bed anymore. In some areas, you were placed in upright sleeping pods to accommodate for the lack of space. As a result, you're getting constant headaches and keep waking up in the middle of the night, forgetting where you are. Also, you were lighter than you are now for most of the trip, so you lost some muscle mass when you came back to Earth. There are some nights where you don't even sleep and wait for the sun to rise, just like you'd see on Saturn or Jupiter. As a result, your sleep cycles got messed up. Life on Earth got way harder for you after such a trip, so you decide to hibernate for some time to adjust back to our planet's conditions, just like you did on Mercury. You accepted an offer to participate in an experimental program that'll take you and your colleagues to different planets in the solar system to see how humans can live there. As a volunteer, you dedicated your entire life to this study. You're 25 years old, and your destination is Mercury. Your colleague, Ryan, is 45. He'll be based on Pluto. Nora, 18, will go to Jupiter. Jeff, 65, will go to Mars. And Vivian, who's also 25, will head to Neptune. Each of you will have a unique chemical compound to boost your lifespan before reuniting. You're all in the launch pad and ready for takeoff. Each of you sits in the cockpit of your spaceship, and it blasts off right to your planets. Even though Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, it's not the hottest. That honor goes to Venus, but it is the fastest planet to orbit the Sun. On Earth, a year is composed of 365 days, but on Mercury, you'll only have to wait about three months to celebrate the new year, 88 days to be exact. Your team's concept of time will change drastically. A part of Einstein's theory of relativity is that time can be affected by acceleration and doesn't flow steadily. 
it moves slowly for objects that are in motion, rather than a stationary observer. It's also affected by the gravitational pull. The closer you are to a large mass with strong gravity, the slower time will be. People can't perceive this phenomenon. Scientists estimated that the difference is around 90 billionths of a second over 79 years. But at different planets with different gravitational mass, the differences might be visible. Astronaut Scott Kelly went to space, while his twin brother, who was six seconds older than him, remained on Earth. When Scott returned, the gap extended to six seconds and five milliseconds. You arrive in your dormitory and unpack your stuff. Outside, you see the wasteland and the temperature is above 800 degrees Fahrenheit. But at night, the temperature drops to a whopping negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit. That's because Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere to trap any heat to keep the planet warm like a desert. The magnetic field has solar winds from the sun that create strong tornadoes with hot plasma. After settling in and placing all your fabulous sci-fi books on the shelf, the ground shakes and knocks down some stuff. Mercury's surface has active tectonic plates that cause earthquakes. It's just something you'll have to get used to. You're able to have a video call with the rest of your colleagues for a quick catch-up. Ryan is on Pluto, billions of miles away from you, and has the worst reception. Pluto is considered to be a dwarf planet and one of the coldest places in our solar system with temperatures reaching negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So Ryan doesn't really leave the dorm. He takes his webcam and shows you and everyone else what's outside his window. There are mountains higher than 10,000 feet covered with methane ice. Pluto needs 248 years to orbit the sun, which means it'll take Ryan the most time to celebrate New Year's. No human can last for such a time on Earth, but the chemical enhancements make it possible. On this day, Ryan will have to wait 90,520 Earth days for New Year's. With gravity, he might age much slower than anyone on Earth. After he shows everyone around, the youngest one in the experiment, Nora, vlogs her new setup in the solar system's biggest planet, Jupiter. Jupiter is so giant that more than 1,300 Earths could fit inside it. That's like 1,300 grapes versus the size of a basketball. And even though it's that big, the planet completes a rotation around its axis in just 10 hours, so a day is considerably shorter here than on Earth. She shows you around her dorm, which resembles a fun playground filled with entertainment. The whole complex is sturdy enough to withstand the extreme winds that can reach more than 335 miles per hour. The people in charge of the experiment were smart enough not to place the complex in the Great Red Spot, an area with a hurricane-like storm that has lasted more than 300 years and this spot is twice the size of Earth. Jupiter needs around 12 Earth years to make a complete orbit around the Sun, which is 4,307 days to be exact. This would mean that Nora would have to wait 24 Earth years to be 20 years old, technically. But Jupiter's gravity is a lot stronger than on Earth's, which means she might age twice as fast. After showing everyone around, Jeff, the oldest one, begins giving everyone a tour of his place on Mars. It's called the Red Planet because it's rich in iron minerals, which might rust. His bunker is classy and feels the most luxurious over all of the others. And it has the best view as well. You get to see the highest mountain in the whole solar system, about three times higher than Mount Everest. Olympus Mons is also a volcano, as if being the tallest mountain wasn't already something extraordinary. Mars needs 687 days to orbit the Sun, which is a little less than two Earth years. It may not be the quickest in the solar system, but it's not as extreme as Pluto. Mars also has weaker gravitational force than Earth, but with 25 hours a day, he may not feel the time difference compared to everyone else. Vivian jumps in late in the call to show around her place on Neptune. She used to live near some hills and mountainsides, so the windiest planet in our solar system isn't that challenging for her. It has a rocky core like Earth and an uninhabitable atmosphere. Neptune is blue because of the absorption of red light by methane in the hydrogen-helium atmosphere. She shows everyone a view from her panoramic window, and you can see all 14 of Neptune's moons and some cloud formations. A whole day on this planet is just 16 hours. Vivian would have to wait 164 Earth years for Neptune to orbit around the Sun, which is 59,860 days on Earth beyond any ordinary lifespan for humans on Earth, but a giant tortoise could be okay with that. 
but with everyone using a special chemical compound, the experiment could be conclusive. Gravity is also strong on Neptune compared to Earth, so she might age just as fast as Nora on Jupiter. After the video call, you take a tour around the complex and find out that other people stay with you in different bunkers. And the same goes for your colleagues on the other planets. 1,000 years later. You've forgotten what Earth looks like. You've forgotten what the atmosphere felt like and even the wind brushing against your skin. But you've made your place pretty cozy with so much plant life and cloned animals from Earth in the bio chambers. You completely forgot about the mission at this point and suddenly got a notification about a video call to update everyone about your progress. You set it up and wait for everyone to log in. After about a minute, no one responds. You haven't heard from them since the last video call a thousand years ago. But then, one by one, everyone joins the video conference. The chemicals in everyone's body, which is enough to extend your lifespan, doesn't affect your body physically. It doesn't make you age at the same rate as on Earth, but it slows it down quite well over 1,000 years. Not everyone looks the same. Ryan was 45 years old on Earth, but he's only aged four years with Pluto orbiting the sun four times in a thousand years. He's now 49 years old, but if he were on Earth, he'd be 1,045 years old. But since he was on Pluto with weak gravity, he didn't physically change as drastic as predicted. Nora was 18 when she went to Jupiter and is still the bubbly girl she was 1,000 years ago. It takes 12 years for the planet to orbit the sun, which means she's now technically 30 years old on Jupiter. But with Jupiter's strong gravity, she now looks 60 years old. Jeff landed on Mars when he was 65 years old. And if it takes 687 days for a complete orbit around the sun, then that would make him 596 years old at the moment. Instead of looking extremely old, the weak gravity on the red planet made him age slower relative to the time spent. He looks to be around 80 years old. After landing on Neptune, Vivian, who was your age, is now only 31 years old on the blue planet. It takes 164 years for it to make a full rotation, making her quite old. And with Neptune's gravity just as strong as Jupiter's, she jumped in age and looks like she's in her 70s. You reveal that you're 4,147 years old on Mercury. Since it only takes 88 days for the planet to revolve around the Sun, you're now technically the most senior amongst them. But Mercury's weak gravity makes you look like you're in your 40s. The ground shakes and you hear a loud cracking sound. Oh no, the dome is failing. Everyone runs to their escape pods to evacuate. People are pushing and shoving. The Earth-like atmosphere in the dome is going to be compromised and you'll be exposed to the thin elements on the surface of Mars. Everyone rushes to put their helmets on. The crack is getting bigger by the second and people are panicking, trying to get on the escape shuttles as quickly as possible. In the chaos, they all jam into the wrong ships and there isn't any room for you. Red warning lights begin to flash in the dome and a voice rings out, telling everyone to put their helmets on. The Martian atmosphere is only minutes away from rushing in, and humans won't be able to breathe otherwise. This is just your luck. You only just arrived on Mars. As the ships zoom off into the distance, you wonder what you should do. You call out for help, but no one answers. Suddenly, a robot guide rolls up behind you, and you hear a faint noise coming from its speakers. It says, no one can hear you because the atmosphere on Mars is so much less dense than on Earth. It also has a lot of carbon dioxide, which absorbs sound waves. Even if a loud concert was happening just 30 feet away, it would sound like it was miles away. Would you like me to assist you with anything? You ask it for help, and it shows you a 3D layout of the entire dome. You can see a few other shuttle stations, so you decide to aim for them. Unfortunately, you're going to need to get to the opposite side of the dome to reach another shuttle station. Just as you begin to panic and wonder how you could get there, the robot transforms into a bike and tells you to hop on. You get in and cruise through the city, looking at all the empty buildings and streets. The crack is getting even bigger, and tiny pieces of the dome begin to fall from above, like snow. When you arrive at the other station, the last few people are boarding the only shuttle. You chase after them, desperately trying to get their attention. As you ding the bell on your bike, though, it barely makes any noise at all. Their ship pulls away before they can notice you. You ask why sounds aren't working, 
and the robot explains that you can barely hear high-pitched noises on Mars. The carbon dioxide makes high-pitched noises, like bells and chirping birds, almost impossible to hear. If only you were still on Earth, they might have noticed you. The robot tells you that there's one last chance to escape. He transforms into a tiny spaceship. You get in, and he flies through the crack in the dome out into space. It's going so fast that you should be back on Earth before long. Just as you're starting to relax and enjoy the sights of space, you see a red light flashing on the robot. You ask it what's wrong, but you get no response. Suddenly, you realize that you can't hear anything in space. Sound travels in waves, and it needs something to move through, like air or water. Space is a vacuum with no air, so you can't hear any sounds at all. The spaceship suddenly changes direction and blasts off away from Earth. You try to steer the robot in the right direction, but you can't figure out how to get its attention. The ship charts a flight all the way to Venus. As you get closer, the turbulence kicks in. Venus has winds faster than any tornado on Earth. You keep getting swept away, trying to find a safe space to land in. The robot manages to keep a steady course, despite the wind throwing it all over the place. You can already feel the heat through all the layers. Finally, the robot spots a small cave in the distance and attempts to land there. As soon as the robot touches ground, it morphs into a spacesuit you can wear, so you're safe in the extreme environment. Today's forecast in Venus? Heat. Extremely boiling temperatures all day and night. Expect clouds of sulfuric acid and gale force winds. The atmosphere is mainly made up of carbon dioxide, so you can expect your voice to drop deeper too because of the planet's dense atmosphere. It's only the second planet closest to the sun, but it's actually the hottest. Its atmosphere traps the heat from the sun and keeps it around the planet. It's actually so hot on Venus that it could melt lead. If you were cruising by with the spaceship, the whole thing would melt in a matter of minutes. Luckily, you have this indestructible robot armor. You try to ask the robot how to get back, and your voice sounds crazy. Your vocal cords vibrate slower here than on Earth, which makes the pitch lower. But at the same time, the speed of sound on Venus is a lot faster, making it more squeaky. Then, the high carbon dioxide content in the air creates a weird effect that tricks your brain into thinking that the sound source is small. Overall, you sound something like a cartoon duck. You look out across the horizon and see many hills and mountains scattered across the plain. But the robot tells you that many of these are volcanoes. Venus actually has more volcanoes than any other planet in the solar system. Scientists discover more than 1,600 only on the surface, which could mean there are even more than that still undiscovered. Yeah, maybe being here all day isn't such a good idea. And not just because of the heat. A single day on Venus lasts 243 Earth days. In fact, a day on Venus is longer than a year, because it only takes 225 days for it to complete a rotation around the Sun. It's hard to understand each other, but you eventually manage. The robot tells you that it just got lost, and that you'll be back on Earth in no time. While walking around the cave, you realize that you're actually inside a volcano. You tell the robot to hurry up and get you back home before it erupts. It's clearly not very good at navigating space, though, because it's not long before you end up somewhere else. You're now on Titan, Saturn's largest moon. The moon is so large that it's even bigger than Mercury, the planet closest to the Sun. The spaceship arrives in the atmosphere, which feels and behaves similar to Earth's. The only noticeable difference is the orangey haze hanging in the air, which makes it a lot more difficult to see. As you descend towards the moon, the robot detects signs of cyanide gas all over the surface and fluffy clouds made out of iced methane. You land on a soft spot and set about trying to get the robot to take you back to the right place. At least this time, you're not sweating. The robot transforms again and begins to scan the surroundings. The atmosphere is around 60% thicker than on Earth. Walking around feels like you're wading through maple syrup. There is a really high nitrogen content in the air, so things sound surprisingly similar to how they do on Earth. You tell the robot you really want to get home now, but it comes out as a loud, raspy shout. This is because Titan has more nitrogen than Earth, and because sound travels a bit slower. Luckily, you can still understand each other here. The robot tells you that it needs to absorb a bit more energy from its solar panels before taking off. So, you have a look around. 
This moon is one of the only things in the solar system that has fixed bodies of liquid like rivers, lakes, and seas on its surface. You can understand why the robot got lost now, given how similar Titan is to Earth. Titan even has liquid cycles, with rain, evaporation, and condensation. This isn't water, like back on Earth, though. The main liquid here is methane. Scientists think that there may be volcanic activity, but instead of molten hot lava spewing out, it's water. Other planets, like Mars, have ice on the peaks of their mountains and evidence of water beneath the surface, but nothing is as close to Earth as Titan. Some scientists believe that this moon could be our next home billions of years from now. The sun's temperature will increase by then, making the Earth's atmosphere uninhabitable. By then, Titan's cool temperatures will be good enough to create stable oceans and sustain life. The robot finally gathers enough electricity to fly away, so you can head home. It'll be nice to have a normal conversation where your voice doesn't sound like an exaggerated cartoon. Whew. Hey, listen up! Do you want to lose weight fast or gain more mass in just a few seconds? Forget all about diets and sports. We have an out-of-this-world way to do it. Space travel! And now I'm taking you to the heart of our solar system, to the sun. Hold on and bring your shades. There's no solid surface here, just hot liquid plasma. So take your heat reflective suit and stay on the platform just above the boiling surface of the star. On Earth, you weigh 135 pounds. But here, on the Sun, your weight is about 3,600 pounds. That's like a small sedan or a hippo. Hey, just saying. It has to do with gravity. The bigger and denser a space object is, the stronger its gravitational pull and the heavier your body feels. The Sun is 99% of the mass of the entire solar system. But although the star is 333,000 times as heavy as Earth, it's also much bigger. That's why gravity is only 27 times stronger on its surface. You can't stand up straight here. You get pulled down by gravity. And if on Earth, you could lift 135 pounds of your own weight, here you can only lift a small pumpkin. Happy Halloween! Moving on, Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun. It's very hot, about twice as hot as the maximum temperature in your kitchen oven. You jump down onto the rocky surface of Mercury and step on the scales. They show only 51 pounds compared to your real weight of 135 pounds. Mercury is almost 17 times smaller than Earth, but its core and crust are very dense. So the gravity here is only 2.5 times weaker than that on our home planet. It means you can jump 2.5 times higher here, and you feel much stronger. You can lift a big gorilla, but don't forget to make it wear a spacesuit with an oxygen supply. When night falls on Mercury, the planet cools down incredibly quickly. The temperature drops to three times as low as at the North Pole. So let's get out of here before you freeze completely stiff. The next planet is Venus. Oh, there's a nasty smell. It's the sulfur dioxide in the air. It would also smell like this near a volcano on Earth. You get on the scales and 122 pounds, almost as much as on Earth. No wonder Venus and Earth are called twin sisters. This planet has almost the same size as ours and only 20% lighter, so it has almost the same gravity. But you couldn't live here because Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, and the atmospheric pressure on its surface is 92 times as high as what we have on Earth. You'd only feel the same pressure if you dive 3,000 feet underwater on our home planet. Without special equipment, you'd be crushed at such a depth. Your spacesuit is made of titanium to withstand this kind of pressure, just like an atmospheric suit for deep sea diving. And it weighs about 830 pounds. It's like carrying the weight of a motorcycle. That's why you feel weaker here than you do on Earth. But moving on to our home planet, or more specifically to its satellite, the Moon. Several astronauts have been here before. You might have seen videos of how awkwardly they moved around, sometimes even falling. That's because gravity on the Moon is six times weaker than on Earth. Your solid 135 pounds of weight turns into 22. So now, you weigh like a plastic shopping cart. On the bright side, you can now lift six times that weight. You can flip a car or lift a pony. You can probably even lift the lunar rover that's still standing here left by the last moon mission. 
One of the astronauts, Alan Shepard, hit several golf balls here. And one ball weighs less than a half an ounce on the moon. Hey, maybe you can use all that power to clean up the stuff people left here. That's about 250 tons, including rovers, broken space probes, lunar module sections, golf balls, and the like. Nah, let's do the cleanup later. Now we're going to Mars. Hey, you're the first human on the surface of the red planet. And the first thing you do is weigh yourself, of course. Ah, 50 pounds, almost three times less than on Earth. It's even less than the weight of a capybara, a big rodent from South America. That's because Mars is 50% as light and 10 times as small as our home planet. And since gravity is weaker here, you become three times stronger. You could lift two of your friends. But this kind of gravity is actually a problem for people. We're planning to colonize Mars. But our muscles are used to the constant gravity of Earth. They won't work at their full capacity on the red planet. This will cause health problems for the astronauts, so they'll need to exercise all the time or tie weights on themselves to become heavier. They'll have to carry at least 10, 20-pound dumbbells to get close to their real weight and keep their muscles toned. Now, a quick trip to Jupiter. This is a gas giant. Hey, again with a gas. And it doesn't have a solid surface. All you see are dense clouds. So it's probably best to stay on the platform. Jupiter is 317 times as heavy as Earth, so the gravity here is much stronger. Your scales show 340 pounds. That's like the weight of a big wild boar on Earth. Now, you can barely stand on your feet in your spacesuit. You feel very weak. The maximum weight you can lift here is 60 pounds. That's as much as a husky dog weighs. Let's take a look at Jupiter's moon Europa. You stand on the scales and see 18. Yep, gravity is so weak here that you weigh like a garden gnome. At the same time, you can easily lift 1,000 pounds. That's like a horse or a grand piano. With that kind of strength on Earth, you could flip a school bus or lift a small car over your head, if you wanted to. Moving on, Saturn, another gas giant. Hold on tight, whoo winds here can reach 1,100 miles per hour. Such a gust of wind could carry you across the United States from one coast to another in just two hours. Hurry up and get on the scales. 144 pounds. It's a little more than you weigh on Earth. That's why you feel a little weaker, like after a good workout at the gym. Saturn's moon, Titan. You might want to stick around a bit longer because here you feel like a real weightlifter. You can lift seven grown-ups in your arms. Or a great white shark. Just be careful with those teeth. And your own weight here is about 17 pounds, like a domestic cat. Maybe a fat tabby. Uranus is the coldest planet in our solar system. It's 10 times as cold there as in a freezer. The scales show 120 pounds. You can lift a truck wheel here. The last planet in our solar system, Neptune. It's 17 times as heavy as Earth and 4 times its size. And the strongest winds ever recorded blow here. The number on the scales is 150 pounds. Yep, you've gained a little weight. But the same would happen if you took a dumbbell in your hands on Earth. Now, how about moving to more unique space objects? For example, a neutron star. This is one of the heaviest and densest objects in the universe. A neutron star has the weight of the sun, but it's so small that it would fit in Manhattan. But this space object has a solid surface, so you can land your spaceship here. The neutron star's weight and density makes gravity incredibly strong here. Your 135 pounds on Earth turn into 190 plus 11 zeros pounds here. You'd be flattened like a pancake on a neutron star. You wouldn't even be able to pick up a match here. A regular sewing needle would weigh 140,000 tons. That's like 2,000 Boeing 737s. Next in line is a black hole. Well, we don't even have a number to describe your weight here. Black holes are the densest and heaviest objects in the universe. They lie at the centers of galaxies and can weigh millions and billions of times more than the sun. They're so heavy that they warp space-time. Once you're in a black hole's gravitational field, you can never get out of there. And the gravitational pull increases with every inch you get closer to the center of the black hole. If you were falling into a black hole and extended your arm forward, the force affecting your fingers would be much stronger than that pulling on your elbow and your hand would stretch like spaghetti. Your weight is infinite here, and your strength is infinitely small. Don't even hope to lift a single atom or photon of light here. Yeah, that's enough. Let's go home.
If you landed on Mercury, the first thing you'd notice would be how close it is to the Sun. It's actually the closest planet to the big ball of fire and the smallest. But it's not the hottest planet. Venus takes credit for that. It takes Earth 365 days to orbit the Sun, and it takes Mercury more than three months. Well, 88 days to be exact. The days are boiling hot, with a temperature reaching above 800 degrees Fahrenheit. But on the other side of the planet that the Sun doesn't reach, the temperatures drop to negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Mercury's atmosphere can't hold any heat when it's nighttime, just like a desert. Deserts have no atmosphere, which is why they have no moisture and no clouds or rain. If you manage to get from one end of the planet to the other and always stay in between the scorching heat and freezing cold, then you can survive. But oxygen isn't a friend to Mercury's atmosphere, so you just live for as long as you could hold your breath. Plus, there's a magnetic field that has solar winds from the sun that create plasma tornadoes. Venus can heat up to almost 1,000 degrees, but gravity is really similar to that of Earth. You can go for walks by the mountains and even go jogging, but the temperature will instantly melt you. So maybe forget about those jogging sessions. The extreme pressure would also crush you like a can. It's like being half a mile underwater on Earth. So you'd only last a few seconds on Venus. The red planet is home to the highest mountain in the solar system, around three times taller than Mount Everest. And it's also a volcano. Despite being called the red planet, Mars is actually really cold. It needs a little less than two years to rotate around the sun, or 687 days to be precise. And almost like Earth, it has 25 hours in a day. The atmosphere over there is very thin, but unbreathable. The planet has loads of dust storms that cover the entire planet, and polar caps that are covered with carbon dioxide. You won't freeze in your spot, but you'd need some thick clothing to keep warm. It's possible to last as long as you can hold your breath. On the bright side, though, you'd get to see some incredible views. The solar system's biggest planet is the mighty Jupiter. If Jupiter was the size of a basketball, then Earth would just be the size of a single grape compared to it. It only needs 10 hours to rotate around its axis, which is a lot shorter than Earth's. One of the best tourist attractions is the Great Red Spot, an area with a hurricane-like storm that's lasted more than 300 years. Oh, and the area is about twice the size of Earth. The largest planet in our solar system needs around 12 Earth years, or 4,307 days, to make a complete circle around the Sun. But Jupiter's gravity is a lot stronger than Earth's. Besides the lack of oxygen and winds that can keep you suspended in the air forever, the immense pressure would crush you. Visiting here won't last longer than a few seconds. Pluto is a former planet furthest from the Sun in our solar system, and is now considered to be a dwarf planet. And because it's that far, it's one of the coldest places ever, with temperatures reaching negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Definitely bring a jacket. Or two. Methane ice covers the mountains that soar at over 10,000 feet. Pluto needs 248 years to orbit the Sun. It's technically still in rotation, waiting to celebrate New Year's. But it just needs six Earth days to complete a rotation around itself. And, surprise, surprise, the air is also unbreathable. Besides the methane floating around, nitrogen is also pretty common. The gravity is weak, so you'd have to hold your breath while floating in the air before freezing like an ice cube. Again, you'd only last a couple of seconds. The windiest planet in our solar system is Neptune. The core is similar to that of Earth. It has 14 moons surrounding it. A day is kind of short compared to Earth. You'd have only 17 hours in a single day. And similar to Pluto, it needs more than 150 years to spin around the Sun. Neptune is also known as the Blue Planet because of the absorption of the red light by methane in the hydrogen-helium atmosphere. So besides not breathing, the pressure can also crush you, just like on Jupiter. No one can last more than a few seconds there. The second biggest planet is none other than Saturn, with rings surrounding it. From far away, its rings look like one big chunk of rock spinning around. But in fact, it's made up of many layers of ice particles and rocks, ranging in all sizes, from tiny pebbles to bus-sized objects. The rings are shaped in such a way because of the gravity around Saturn. 
A day on Saturn lasts only 11 hours. It's very windy in the upper atmosphere. Saturn also has plenty of moons like Jupiter. And, just like on Jupiter, you'd be crushed by extreme pressure deep in the planet before you can open your eyes. You wouldn't last longer than a few seconds here, either. Titan is Saturn's largest moon and second largest moon in the solar system. It has the closest Earth-like conditions compared to any existing planet or moon, so living here should be a walk in the park. But the cold weather will freeze you. This moon is actually the only place in the whole solar system that has liquid rivers, oceans, and lakes. They're all covered with methane and ethane, and the atmosphere is very similar to that of Earth. It even rains here at certain times. Our moon isn't so friendly either. Because of the lack of oxygen, you can just last as long as you can hold your breath. The cosmic rays from the sun will also affect you, but skipping along the moon craters is actually quite fun. If you tried going to the sun, you'd vaporize in the blink of an eye. The temperatures can reach around 27 million degrees Fahrenheit, and that's just an estimated measurement near the core. There are still the outer layers you need to worry about that'll also leave you in atoms. Your best bet is to hit the brakes and take the nearest exit. Estimated time on the sun? Less than a second. Our little blue planet is the only place we can live in where an average human can reach 80 years old. We adapt it to many weather conditions that aren't crazy, with the gravity just about right so we don't feel crushed. We can live anywhere from dry deserts to snowy ice peaks. It's the only place that has the perfect balance for us to survive. Scientists hope that one day we can live on planets other than our own. Mars is the closest place that can host us, considering we'd have to build a dome in order to live there. Elon Musk wants to use Tesla bots as the first non-human crew to land there and start building our future homes. The robots can acquire information about the planet and mimic the way humans walk and behave, so it'll let us see what we'll need to worry about. In all cases, humans will need to be suited up in order to come close to any planet. Our bodies aren't designed to face such conditions unless we evolve naturally to fit the environment. The tardigrade is the only animal on Earth that can live in the most extreme conditions, from the deepest oceans to the highest mountain peaks. They shot some of these microscopic critters into space and found out that they can live in the vacuum of space for up to 10 days and return without breaking a sweat. They're probably the only known creatures on Earth that can live the longest on any planet except the sun. Scientists claim that if a large asteroid hits the Earth, then tardigrades can perfectly survive. But humans are simply not designed to live outside of Earth without the proper gear. Get your closet ready. We're moving to Mercury. Your mission is to find out what you need to wear there to feel comfortable. So, Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun in our solar system. It's pretty hot here, about 800 degrees Fahrenheit, twice as much as your kitchen oven can produce. You need a heat reflective suit like this. It looks like foil for duck roasting. The shiny, almost mirror-like surface reflects the heat rays and keeps everything inside from getting baked. That's you. This suit is designed to get to the hearts of volcanoes on Earth and can withstand up to 1,470 degrees Fahrenheit. That's twice as much as at the equator of Mercury. Oh, and bring an oxygen tank. Otherwise, you won't be able to breathe there and you need to strap some heavy dumbbells to your legs. Mercury is smaller than Earth, and gravity is almost three times weaker here. So you have to increase your weight almost three times to feel comfortable. It gets extremely cold there at night, so you need to stuff your thermal suit with insulation. But even that won't save you from the cold. It's three times colder than at the North Pole. Plus, Mercury's atmosphere doesn't protect you from solar radiation as well as Earth's. So, you need to wear thick lead plates under your suit for protection. But the best thing to do is just evacuate from this planet. The next one is Venus. Although it's called Earth's twin sister, the scenery here looks frightening. A hot desert with volcanoes and clouds so dense that you can barely see the sun. These clouds contribute to the greenhouse effect. So, Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system, 890 degrees Fahrenheit. But the usual heat reflective suit won't help you this time. The atmospheric pressure here is 92 times higher than on the surface of the Earth. That's like diving 3,200 feet underwater. So the air on Venus will just crush you. To survive, you need an airtight suit made of titanium or other sturdy materials. On Earth, we use an atmospheric diving suit like this to withstand the intense pressure underwater. 
It's like a mini submarine in the shape of a human body, and it's already equipped with an oxygen tank. Yes, the air on Venus is not only unbreathable, it's also toxic. The next planet is Earth. Just look out the window and decide for yourself what to wear today, okay? Let's go to Earth's satellite, the Moon. A few people have been here already, and they were wearing pretty big spacesuits. The main thing is to bring an oxygen tank. It's contained in a backpack along with the life support system. Even though it's cold, there's no atmosphere, it's almost a vacuum, and there's no air particles to take heat from your body, so you won't freeze instantly. Your suit itself should be airtight and keep the atmospheric pressure inside. The lower the pressure, the lower the temperature the fluid can boil over. In space, fluids from your body can evaporate in seconds. You don't want that, so you should wear a spacesuit. It'll also save you from dangerous solar radiation. The moon is defenseless against it. And the gravity here is six times weaker than on Earth. So you can jump six times higher and lift six times more weight. It makes sense to take a little weight with you, so you don't feel as clumsy as the first astronauts. Next up, Mars. In summer, you could walk around here in shorts and a t-shirt. The highest recorded temperature here is about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. In colder times, you'd have to wear a sweater and a warm jacket here, maybe even two. The average temperature here is slightly colder than the coldest point on Earth. But the atmospheric pressure here is frustrating. It's 170 times less than we're used to. Take the altitude at which commercial airplanes fly on Earth. Multiply it by three. The conditions there are very similar to those on Mars. It's cold and there's no oxygen to breathe. Without a spacesuit, you'd last two minutes at most on Mars. So you need an airtight spacesuit on you all the time on the surface of Mars. NASA scientists are preparing a new generation of spacesuits that will allow astronauts to climb, crawl, and bend without difficulty. You'd feel like a real athlete on the surface of Mars. The gravity there is three times weaker than on Earth, so you could easily lift an animal the size of a tiger there. Don't forget to put a spacesuit on it, of course. Now let's fly through the asteroid belt further into space and arrive at Jupiter. It's the largest planet in our solar system, and it's a gas giant. That means there's no solid surface, so you can't even stand there. Although, hypothetically, you could jump into Jupiter. Then you'd keep falling all the way to the planet's core. Suppose you're standing on a platform just above the surface of the planet. The first thing you feel is the force of gravity. It's 2.5 times stronger here. You feel it pulling you down, and you can barely even jump up. So it would be nice to equip your spacesuit with an exoskeleton to support your body and help you move. Plus, it's incredibly cold. You'll feel the cold at about negative 229 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface of the clouds of the gas giant. And what makes things worse is the constant wind. It can reach speeds of up to 900 miles per hour, almost twice as fast as the speed of commercial airplanes on Earth. That kind of cold wind will instantly draw heat away from your body, so your spacesuit must be really thick and warm. But the pressure at the top of these clouds is almost the same as on Earth. Technically, you could even take off your helmet here if it weren't for the lack of oxygen and severe cold. Maybe Saturn promises better conditions. Another gas giant. The gravitational force here is almost the same as on Earth, so nothing will constrain your movements except for a massive spacesuit. It's even colder here than on Jupiter, and the pressure here is about the same as about 15 feet underwater on Earth. So, the spacesuit not only lets you breathe and stay warm, but keeps your eardrums intact. Hey, hold on tight! You just almost got blown away by a gust of wind over 1,100 miles per hour. That's not unusual on Saturn. That kind of wind on Earth could get you from one coast of the United States to another in just two and a half hours. The only option to warm up here is to jump down to the center of the planet. The closer you get to the core, the warmer it gets. But the pressure rises at a tremendous rate. In just a few seconds of freefall, even the toughest titanium suit will be crushed. Let's finally step onto a solid surface, Titan, Saturn's moon. It's 1.5 times the size of our moon and 80% heavier. 
and its surface is mostly composed of water, ice, and rock. The pressure here is a little bit higher than on Earth. You wouldn't feel any discomfort if it weren't extremely cold. Titan is 9.5 times further from the Sun than Earth, so our star can barely warm this moon. The air here is mostly nitrogen, just like on Earth. But oxygen is completely absent here, so it's impossible to breathe without a spacesuit. There may be a huge ocean beneath Titan's surface. Saturn's gravity heats up this moon's core enough to make the ice melt. Plus, it must be extremely salty, which means it can remain liquid even at very low temperatures. The next two planets are Uranus and Neptune. So Uranus holds the record for the coldest planet in our solar system. The temperature here is about negative 224 degrees Celsius, so bring the warmest spacesuit you have. They say if you jump to the center of Uranus, at one point the pressure becomes so high that it turns hydrogen into a crust of ice. And if you get even lower, you can see the rocky core. Neptune, in turn, holds the record for the strongest winds in the solar system. It's an ice giant, just like Uranus. So the dress code here is the usual. A super warm spacesuit, a tank of oxygen, and a heating system. So far, we don't have the kind of spacesuit that would help you survive on any of the gas giants. But if you get to the core of Neptune, it gets too hot. Its temperature is almost the same as on the surface of the Sun. It's the year 2600, and the new Frontiers program has finally begun. You've got the list of planets to plan dwellings for, and the first one is Venus. The Earth's evil twin sister meets you with a refreshing 800 degrees Fahrenheit and a beautiful sulfuric acid rainstorm. First of all, the heat means living on the surface here is next to impossible. So you immediately put the prospective house several dozen feet underground. The walls, floor, and ceiling must be made of some heat-resistant and durable material. So you make them out of hafnium carbide. Discovered way back in 2016, it withstands temperatures of over 7,000 degrees. Next, you install the air cooling and purification system. It captures the toxic air from the Venusian atmosphere and pulls it through a complex network of filters, delivering breathable air to the dwelling. As an added benefit, the temperature of this air can be easily turned up thanks to what's going on outside. You can create a separate room below the main space and dub it the generator room. The device there will use the almost infinite geothermal energy of the planet to provide the house with electricity. You think for a moment and add a geothermal bathroom as well. There's no water on Venus, but it can be extracted and separated from its acidic clouds. The piping system would include a heating unit for hot water and a cooling unit with liquid nitrogen for cold water. Another separate space is the garden. Since no plants can survive on the surface, you create a spacious hall with bright lights on the ceiling and a sprinkler system throughout the area. You have large patches of soil for vegetables, several acres for fruit plants, and a big patch in the center for a couple of long-living trees like oaks. They'll provide additional oxygen for the whole building. The garden is encased in a shell of hafnium carbide as well, so that the plants don't wilt in the excess heat of the Venusian soil. You check if everything's accounted for and go to your next stop. Saturn. It's a gas planet, but there's a thin yet stable layer that can be called the sweet spot. His temperature is just right for humans to feel fine. You create a hover platform to build your house on. There's just no solid ground on Saturn at all. The platform's equipped with wind-powered turbines. The winds on the gas giant reach incredible speeds, so it will need to counteract them, at the same time feeding from the hurricanes. The pressure and temperature are just about right in this place, so your main concern is the wind again. You make the dwelling low and looking almost like a frisbee for better aerodynamics. The walls and roof are made from a single slab of sturdy metal so that powerful gusts can't tear the roof away. You also make them several feet thick and add some windows with space-grade glass panes that won't break. Water can be extracted from another layer using a series of similar platforms with built-in pipes. Electricity and heat are no problem either, thanks to the powerful winds. The only problem here is food, but it can be imported from other inhabited planets at first, along with the fertile soil for the garden. You'll create a space for it on another hover platform for the future. 
Satisfied with your results, you head to the next destination on your list, Europa. This moon of Jupiter's is covered in a miles-thick crust of ice full of canyons and crevices. But deep below, there's a whole ocean of salt water bigger than all the oceans on old Earth taken together. You take it into account and go for an underground dwelling again. The temperature is freezing, but the closer you are to the hot planetary core, the warmer it is. You place the dwelling as deep as you can to safely extract water from the underground ocean. The walls and ceiling are padded with insulation, and in the cellar, there's a home water purification system that turns salty water into the potable kind. Since there's no atmosphere to speak of, the breathable air is extracted from the ice. As it melts, the water vapor is collected and filtered, then enriched with other necessary substances and delivered to the dwelling. As for food, you go for an unusual solution – edible marine plants and fish. You create a separate tank to cultivate algae right in the ocean, and different kinds of fish can be imported from old Earth and other inhabited planets to breed on Europa. Next stop, Pluto. The tiny dwarf planet, just one-sixth of old Earth in width, has a great potential for terraforming. So you immediately create a big dome for your dwelling. The sun shines much weaker here than in any other place in the solar system, so you make sunlight-enhancing panels all across the dome. They'll allow the surface underneath to receive more light and warmth, bringing the area to a comfortable temperature. The ice on Pluto consists of frozen water, just like on Earth. So you build a station for melting it and collecting the resulting liquid into large tanks for later use. There's also a possible liquid ocean deep under the surface. So you add a deep drilling platform, but put a question mark on it. You don't know if it's going to be useful yet. With the area warmed up and well lit, you make a pretty ordinary dwelling like ones we're used to on old Earth and terraform Mars. A couple of stories, carbon or titanium alloyed walls and ceiling for durability, and a fortified cellar. Still, you also add emergency insulation padding that will only trigger if something happens to the lighting dome. If it's breached, the temperature will quickly drop to below freezing. There's also very little atmosphere on Pluto, so breathable air will have to be generated from the ice again. This time, you combine the water collecting system with the air generating facility. While one produces potable water, the other will collect vapor and enhance it with all the necessary elements. You even go as far as to create a weather controlling device. It will heat up or cool down different layers of the produced air and mix them together to create winds and rain clouds just like on old Earth. This will allow crops to grow in a more natural environment, and Pluto might even become a green planet one day. Right above, in the dark blue sky, Pluto's biggest moon, Charon, is hanging. It's half the dwarf planet in size, which makes it a spectacular view. Its climate is almost identical to that of Pluto's. In a fit of inspiration, you create a vacation home for Plutonians. Here, under a similar dome, they'll be able to explore another little world and look at their dwarf planet from the other side. Which is always the same side, by the way, like the Earth's moon, which reminds you of the next destination. Zarmina, previously known as Gliese 581g, is 41 light years away, the longest trip so far. The planet's tidally locked to its sun, which means there's perpetual day on its one side and eternal night on the other. It's not only about light, but heat as well. The day side is much hotter, and the night side is partially covered in ice. Unless we terraform the planet, the most comfortable area to inhabit is right between the two sides, called the Terminator Zone. It's neither too hot nor too cold here, and there's an eternal twilight. The sun is always just above the horizon. The good news is that the atmosphere on Zarmina, although volatile, is rather close to the old Earth's. But you still cover the selected area with a protective dome just in case. Human dwellings here don't have to be specially protected from the elements. And there's liquid water, too. You build a pretty generic house, much like the one on Pluto, but then add a few crucial details. First, the weather controlling device. Despite the old Earth-like atmosphere, dwellers will need a stable change of weather to grow crops. Then you cover the dome with moving plates. Living in a constant dust might be pretty depressing, so the plates will move in 12-hour patterns. During the daytime, they will turn to enhance the sunlight, while at night, they'll deflect it back, making the sky dark. After that, you travel to both edges of the Terminator Zone and install geothermal plants. 
On the hot side, the plant will generate energy for all the settlers' needs and take hot water to use in households. On the cold side, the system will make cold water for the ice. The night side can also be used as a giant refrigerator. Dwellers could store things they need frozen here. To make it easier to access, you stretch the dome from edge to edge and create some simple storage facilities where the night begins in earnest. There are many different conditions on other planets and moons that could affect how your pet would evolve there. Take gravity, for example. On a bigger or denser planet, gravity would be higher, meaning that life would evolve to be shorter, sturdier, and perhaps with multiple limbs for structural support. On a lighter planet with weaker gravity, life could hop, soar, and glide more easily, and would be more likely to evolve a lighter, taller build. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun, a dusty, cold, desert world. Mars is also a dynamic planet with seasons, polar ice caps, canyons, extinct volcanoes, and evidence that it was even more active in the past. Gravity on Mars is lower than on Earth, and it's farther from the Sun, so we would see less sunlight. Mars also has no protective magnetic field due to its thin atmosphere, exposing everything to radiation. Sometimes, strong winds create dust storms that howl around the whole planet, and the dust continues to settle for months after. Your pet dog on Mars would probably have a taller, robust build to compensate for poor gravity, and would have bigger eyes to better perceive the far-off sun. To protect itself from radiation, your dog would have to switch its pigmentation from melanin to carotenoids, which give carrots, tomatoes, and oranges their color. So the dog would probably have orange skin. Since Mars has weak gravity, your cat would probably be lighter and would jump more to get around the place. It would also have longer legs. Jupiter is called a gas giant. The planet is covered in thick red, brown, yellow, and white clouds. The clouds make the planet look like it has stripes. Living on the surface of Jupiter might prove to be challenging. Since there's no actual surface, the planet consists entirely of gas. But it doesn't mean it's just a giant cloud hanging in space. If you venture through its atmosphere to deeper parts, the gas becomes denser until it turns into liquid. So one layer of Jupiter is an ocean made of hydrogen instead of water. With high pressure, extreme temperatures, and a fluid environment, we'll have to draw some inspiration from deep water dwellers who deal with the same conditions but on a smaller scale. Your cats and dogs would be big isopods with shells to protect them from Jupiter's radiation. Like its fellow gaseous neighbor Jupiter, Saturn is a gargantuan cloud of hydrogen and helium with no solid land and powerful winds. Like Jupiter, it gets tighter within, but its core is much smaller. Its iconic rings are made of a myriad of ice particles, so nothing could live on them, unfortunately. Saturn's volume is greater than 760 Earths, and it's the second most massive planet in the solar system, about 95 times Earth's mass. Saturn's average density is less than water, so this behemoth of a planet could float in a bathtub if there were one of a suitable size. The only way to move within Saturn's thick fog is by flopping around like a jellyfish. Your dog would probably have an umbrella-shaped bell to propel itself up and no skeleton so that it wouldn't be crushed by the pressure. Your cat would have jellyfish tentacles to move around. Life is tough on Mercury. This tiny planet is closest to the sun, so the sunlight here is seven times more powerful than on Earth. No sunscreen would be able to manage that. Mercury is about two-fifths the size of Earth, with a similar gravity to Mars, or about 38% of Earth's gravity. This means that you could jump three times as high on Mercury, and heavy objects would be easier to pick up. Mercury's temperature is extreme, swinging between a scorching 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit at night. It's all accompanied by constant meteor showers and quakes. As a bonus, there is a very thin atmosphere and no air to breathe. Flesh and bone could never handle these severe conditions. So instead, your pets here would be made of something similar to refractory metal, like titanium. There'd be no need for a respiratory system, so their pretty metal faces would be without a nose, and their eyes would probably look like thick sunglasses to protect them from all this sun exposure. If there's anywhere harder to live than on Mercury, it's Venus. Venus is the second planet from the sun, 
and is Earth's closest neighbor in the solar system. Venus is the brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon, and sometimes looks like a bright star in the morning or evening sky. The temperature here is a whopping 880 degrees Fahrenheit, and the atmosphere is so thick, it creates a greenhouse effect. The surface is dry and full of surprises like volcanic eruptions, hurricane winds, and lightning. And as a cherry on top, the pressure here feels like you're one mile underwater, giving you a never-ending headache. It would be hard to imagine your pet living on Venus. The only things that could possibly survive there are anaerobic bacteria. Venus eats away at everything, even metal, making quick work of any human spacecraft. And Venus's atmosphere contains phosphine, which is toxic for anything that breathes oxygen, but means life for microbes. Icy, dark, and plagued by strong winds, Uranus and Neptune are mostly made of cold liquids, methane, water, and ammonia. Methane makes Uranus blue, and it has faint rings, while Neptune is dark, cold, and very windy, as it's the last of the planets in our solar system. It's more than 30 times as far from the Sun as Earth is. Neither of them has a solid surface, and their atmospheres slowly merge into the water around the planet's core. To boot, gravity on Neptune is stronger than on Earth and applies more pressure on everything. With such powerful gravity, your dog would be shorter and your cat would be stockier with muscular bodies and thicker skins against the cold. And considering the fluid environment, your pet's best bet is to become like a cosmic whale or manatee floating around the blue planets. Pluto is not very big. It's only half as wide as the United States. Pluto is smaller than Earth's moon. This dwarf planet takes 248 Earth years to go around the sun. If you lived on Pluto, you would have to wait 248 Earth years to celebrate your first birthday. One day on Pluto is about six and a half days on Earth. The farthest planet-like object from the sun is appropriately freezing cold and covered with ice, with weak gravity and a flimsy atmosphere. The sun, from Pluto, is nothing more than a dot on the horizon, much like the moon for Earth, so there's not much going on in terms of light. But scientists suggest that there may be a water ocean under Pluto's surface and some nicer weather. Let's take notes from Earth's creatures with built-in antifreeze, like some insects and fish. Low gravity makes the muscles and bones shrink and the space between vertebrae expand, making your pets taller. Their posture would also change since their spine, for the most part, would be out of a job. So they'd probably be tall, thin, and somewhat spider-like with spindly limbs and a curved spine. On other planets beyond the solar system, the boundaries between plants and your pets could be blurred, and your pets might merge with plant life. Your pets might become tree-like with beating hearts attached to their bodies, or with feet to move to better positions as they compete for light and water. You could also have a rabbit that spends most of its time staying still, photosynthesizing, and only running away if threatened. Or a massive dinosaur-like horse that splays itself out on the ground to get nutrients directly from the soil and obtains extra energy with the help of plants on its back. Cooperation could lead to some fascinating pets, such as a sea of amoeba acting as a single jelly-like mega-creature, thousands of voracious shrimp-like carnivores forming a single organism that devours anything in its way, or a web of intertwined trees that collect water in wide pitchers at the top of their canopies. Getting oxygen to muscles is a key for your pet's endurance. Here on Earth, octopuses use a copper-based molecule in their blood to shuttle oxygen, making them more sluggish than mammals and birds that use iron-based hemoglobin. Scientists have speculated about other types of oxygen transport that could make animals fitter. In atmospheres with more oxygen, we might see a pet monkey that can fly without ever having to stop for a rest. On cold planets and moons without much sunlight, such as the moons of Saturn and Jupiter, your pet dog might have to get by with chemical energy rather than take it from the sun. Also, in worlds without light, such as the depths of Enceladus's oceans, there might be little need to evolve eyes. Pets would probably sense their environments using other means, like gills and vibration sensors. We all remember seeing the Apollo lunar rover on the moon built for space missions in the 70s. Besides transporting astronauts for certain explorations, they were used for taking pictures and collecting soil samples for scientists to study. The vehicle was designed by Boeing, the company famous for building airplanes, and cost around 38 million bucks to build. 
the kind of loose change you'd find today in Elon Musk's couch. In the far future, technologies will be so advanced that a regular car for the moon will behave like a regular SUV we have today. It'll have a sleek look and might be produced by some famous car manufacturers available. Back then, the lunar rover used a T-shaped throttle to move the car left, right, backward, and forward. The futuristic one can be voice-controlled and require minimal human control. And we can't leave out the Earth roof. Hey, you really don't need a moon roof on the moon. Anyway, the moon's driving conditions are not that extreme compared to Mars or other planets. It's hard to believe that the first landing craft to enter Mars was Viking 1, launched on August 20, 1975. It arrived at Mars on June 19, 1976. But decades later, Curiosity, which had six legs and six wheels attached, took the stage as the cute robot explorer. It was designed for the rough terrain, so in the distant future, a human-operated vehicle can have a similar design for people who want to cruise by the Mars sunset. For any human-designed car to work on planets other than the Earth, they have to be electric or anything else that can produce an unlimited supply of energy. Gas-powered vehicles won't work in the vacuum of space, and certainly not on any planet other than our own. It can be powered by the strong sun and convert the energy to run the vehicle. The interior has to accommodate the extreme conditions on the planet, since the atmosphere is very thin and unbreathable. It has to be very warm, since Mars can reach sub-zero temperatures. The matter of gravity isn't that extreme, but frequent dust storms are the problem. The vehicle will also have wheels attached to legs to maneuver around properly, since the terrain is difficult to get around in. Now, my two cents here? Well, I think an all-leather interior with six-way seats front and back will be nice. Adding a 12-speaker sound system with RU Sirius FM radio is a must. Did I mention the Earth roof? Yeah, I did. And don't forget the 60-40 fold-down rear seats so you'll have plenty of room to haul your camping gear on your weekend escapes. Meanwhile, it's still possible to have a panoramic glass view of the interior in a project like a tour bus on Mars. There are plenty of locations to discover, like the tallest mountain in our solar system and the snowy carbon peaks. The Red Planet can also have an express train ride that can take you from one place to another. It'll be one of those luxurious cabins that will take you from one landmark to another since Mars becomes colonized and established. The train will also be electric-powered or powered by another power source. Mars is a place where it's possible to have all kinds of vehicles, since the conditions aren't that different from Earth's. Just don't go outside without a helmet. If we designed a vehicle for Mercury, then get ready for bright light from the sun In which case, we would need to add industrial visors and blackout strips around the glass so that the sun won't get to us. At least, we won't have to worry about the heat, since Mercury isn't the hottest planet in our solar system. Well, the temperatures can reach a soaring 800 degrees on a warm sunny day and drop down to minus 300 degrees at night. The vehicle will have to have multiple layers and coatings to withstand the conditions. And it will most likely have spider legs to move, since rubber wheels will melt instantly. And to save itself from damage, it'll need to dig underground to hide from the sun and atmosphere, just like a crab or those spiders that create hatch floors. Driving a vehicle on Pluto will be very challenging, considering that it's the furthest planet from the sun. Now, Pluto is technically not a planet anymore, but it's still a large enough mass to explore. Temperatures there can reach below 400 degrees. A mere jacket won't cut it. The vehicle will need super insulation to keep the operator warm and fuzzy. Methane ice surrounds the land and covers the mountains. Gravity is also an issue since it's very weak, which will make you float in the air. Now, designing a vehicle for Pluto will be tricky. The key for it to move and not freeze will be how the legs move. It'll also have legs like the one on Mercury, but will have a lot of heat generated to keep warm. The weight is enough to keep this vehicle in place. However, that can't be said for Neptune, the windiest planet in our solar system. It's impossible to breathe in the atmosphere, and the atmospheric pressure will crush you. Designing a vehicle is challenging considering the many external factors and will have to be pressurized to counter the external atmosphere. It will also need a special coating to counter the harsh temperatures. And because Neptune is extremely windy, it would need some sort of anchor to keep it in place. 
something like a large drill that shoots from the belly of the car and digs underground. It will also have spider legs to move around, but they'll behave in a similar motion to how a camel walks. That way, it can maintain its center of gravity. Now, Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, with temperatures reaching 1,000 degrees. The pressure will push your vehicle like a can, so it needs proper internal pressure to balance it out. This car will require all the upgrades for countering the heat. It will need proper coating, no glass, and even a special color to reflect the heat. Nothing can actually stay on the ground for too long, so spider legs won't really work. It'll need to hover slightly above the ground and float around. Now, Saturn is the second largest planet in our solar system and has a very windy upper atmosphere and very strong gravity. The rings around it are made up of ice materials that can range from the size of a pebble to the size of a school bus. The pressure is so strong that you'd be crushed the second you reach its atmosphere. Designing a vehicle would be very challenging and weird. It'll need the best technology for withstanding the crushing pressures and harsh temperatures. The vehicle will have to be large and composed of many internal layers. Since the upper atmosphere is windy, the vehicle will have to remain on the ground for as long as possible. Scientists don't know much of what the surface looks like, so the vehicle will have to be prepared to move on solid surfaces, liquid, and anything else in between. Now, I think it's called slop. It'll need mechanical arms to maneuver through the possible rugged terrain and multiple legs like a centipede. Those arms can pick up things and move them out of the way if it faces some obstacles. The long body can also detach itself and break into smaller pods for a quick escape. From what, we don't yet know. No human can step foot outside even if they wear protective gear. Robots will have to be deployed to test how human bodies can withstand the conditions. Jupiter has harsher conditions than Saturn, with the red spot being the most dangerous area on the planet. It's an extremely large area that has hurricane-like storms that have been going on for years. The vehicle will resemble that of Saturn, but extra heavy-duty. Scientists also don't know what's happening on the surface except for the crushing atmospheric pressure. The vehicle won't be able to move on the surface if it were to pass through the red spot, so it'll have to dig underground and move underneath. For that, it'll require a huge drill and many self-automated drones and vehicles that can be deployed from the main vehicle to help with digging and surveying. Once underground, it'll have legs that will help it crawl and a giant drill nose to dig further. Many of the body parts can also break off into smaller pods to get through certain terrains but can be easily reattached. The craziest place where we can launch a vehicle is the sun. There's no way to imagine it except being self-automated any human on board won't make it halfway in the journey. The launch will have to be from Mercury in a protective facility sheltered from the harsh temperatures. The vehicle will have to be made out of the best resources to withstand the extreme heat and gases and won't last more than a couple of minutes once nearby. It'll most likely resemble a satellite and float around to take some footage for us to study. It'll probably cost trillions of dollars, but the results will be worth it, won't they? Hello there! Thank you for coming to the Space Job Agency. We have a whole bunch of departments. Intergalactic jobs, keep it in Milky Way, our solar system rocks, or gases, <laughs> and many smaller ones. Tired of a 9-to-5 routine on our planet? No problem. Let's see if you have any qualifications for newly opened positions. So, we've got here… Oh! An asteroid miner on Mars. As you know, asteroids are some sort of leftovers from times when our solar system was forming. Our scientists believe it's debris left of planet collisions and destruction. Tens of thousands of asteroids are circling our Sun, and most of them are between the orbits of Jupiter and Mars. That way, Mars is a perfect location for this job. Those asteroids can hide a lot inside. They're made of magnesium, iron, nickel, we believe some of them consist of oxygen, gold, water, and platinum. We need those for our industries. We have a station with food and everything else you'll need up there. So, you're in a specially designed spacecraft. You start from Mars, land on an asteroid, and start mining. Our machinery is lightweight and solar-powered, which means you need less fuel. Sometimes we send robots to do this, sometimes people. 
Robots don't need food or other supplies. On the other hand, they're not so precise as humans. You use similar techniques as miners on the Earth. Basically, you'll need to scrape the material off the asteroid. The majority of the ore will probably fly off, so you'll have to use a big canopy to collect it. Since the gravity on asteroids is so much weaker than on Earth, you'll have to learn how to use grapples to anchor yourself to the surface. That way, you can move around with little effort. Once you're done with one asteroid and the material is sent to Earth, you're going to the next one. Are you good at sports? I can see there is an ad for a ski instructor on Mars. Mars has four seasons, just like Earth. And winter there lasts around six Earth months because the year there is almost twice as long. The snow there is different because it's made of frozen carbon dioxide instead of frozen water. But don't worry, the best scientists made it completely safe. Snowball fights are not so fun. You get a poor pack of frozen carbon dioxide and a bit of water ice. But snowboarding, sledding, and skiing there are so cool. No, literally, the surface is almost frozen. The snow is not as thick as on our planet, but the surface is very slippery, so it's fun. So, you're gonna work there for six months, but if you plan to make some extra cash, we're transferring you to Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Europa is very cold. Its surface is mostly composed of solid water ice, a subsurface ocean we didn't get to see yet. But, hey, our team of space divers is going there in three months. I'll check if there's a position open if you're interested. They say this ocean might have twice as much water as we have on Earth. Plus, our team of scientists still think this is one of the best spots to build Earth-like cities in our solar system. But until then, you can go as a skiing instructor. The surface is made of ice, so we created our own snow to go skiing. You'll like it there. There are many hills and domes on Europa. Some ridges are 5.5 miles across. So if you want some adrenaline, Europa has little to no atmosphere, so your suit protects you from radiation from the sun. Okay, the next one is a driver in a space taxi on Venus. Tourists love going there, despite that it's very, very hot. It's further away from our sun than Mercury, but it's still hotter. The thing is, the atmosphere there is like a blanket that traps the heat. The planet is scorching, so you can't stay there for too long. The company will provide you with a flying car that looks like a mini spaceship. You'll have to be a pretty good driver because the atmosphere is very dense. And it's also quite windy there. The speed often goes over 220 miles per hour. And it can get tricky with the clouds. You won't be able to see because the wind's moving them all the time, so you have to act fast. Plus, Venus is the planet with the most volcanoes in our solar system. Much of its surface is covered with volcanic deposits, making it hard to land and find a safe spot to land. If you accept this job, here's a tip. It's better to stay in the air. The view is amazing. Speaking of volcanoes, you can probably join our team of space volcanologists. As an assistant first, of course, but later, we'll see if you can take a better position in an intergalactic team. For now, you can stay in our solar system. We presume Mars, Venus, Pluto, and Jupiter's moon Europa have active volcanoes, but there's still no proof of that. The spots we know about for sure are moons, Io, Triton, and Enceladus. Moon Finder. We have a department that's looking for new moons, even outside our galaxy. There's also another one where you get to visit and explore moons in our solar system. It has more than 200 moons, so you certainly won't get bored. If we're talking about a planet where you can't even land, like gas giants Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter, you'll visit their moons directly. All major planets have moons except for Mercury and Venus. You'll have to visit these planets first and try to find their moon. Moons are awesome. For example, Dactyl is a moon that doesn't orbit a planet, but an asteroid. Before this, we didn't even know asteroids could have their moons. Hyperion orbits Saturn. It has an irregular shape, and we believe it's probably a part of a much bigger, ancient moon that got destroyed from a collision in the early stage of our solar system. 
It has a low level of density, almost half that of water. And what about Callisto, the oldest one? It orbits Jupiter, and its craters are 4 billion years old. Callisto helped us understand so much about our solar system. Space Jeweler <laughs> If you want to leave our solar system, you can visit what we call Diamond Planet. It's 41 light years away from Earth, located in the Cancer constellation. It's twice as big and dense as Earth, but almost eight times more massive. Its parent star contains way more carbon than our Sun, and this planet probably contains carbon too. The pressure and the temperature are huge, but we have a unique technology to deal with that. It's covered with diamonds, so your job is to collect it and make some amazing space jewelry. You can visit more interesting planets as a space jeweler, like one where it rains rubies and sapphires. The storms there are pretty crazy, but you only get to collect gems scattered across the planet after it's over. If you're more into making something out of glass, there's literally a planet where it rains glass. It's located 63 light years away from us. It's a little bigger than Jupiter, and you'll be amazed by the planet's atmosphere. It has a stunning azure color because it's mostly made of silicate. The wind there is crazy. It hits 5,400 miles per hour. For comparison, the fastest one we've experienced on Earth was 254 miles per hour. Oh, and the last one, Explorer, on the mission called mm -hmm. Planet 9. Beyond Neptune, you'll see many small worlds peacefully dancing in harmony and the stubborn one that's still hiding, the Planet 9. We've been looking at it for a very long time. Our scientists think it exists because they noticed gravitational force affecting a small group of objects with clustered orbits. Planet 9 probably orbits our Sun in 7,400 years. It's six times as massive as Earth. It's either a gas giant or some sort of mini-Neptune, or even a rocky super-Earth. It's well paid, but I must warn you, it's a mission of your lifetime. We don't know when you'll be able to go back. It's far away. Neptune is the starting point of our investigation. It's a gas world, so you can't land on it. So you'll have to go to one of its moons called Triton. It's made of nitrogen ice and rock. You'll be fine. Just watch out for geysers there. They erupt on the crust, and then the atmosphere blows them away. And we're still not sure how dangerous they are. And you'll have to wear a special suit because that's the coldest space object in our solar system we know about. So, are you accepting any of the offers? TRES 2b, or not to be, is a planet where night never ends. And it's not your regular night with stars shining in the beautiful skies. Here, it's pitch dark and scorching hot. TRES 2b is a gas giant roughly one and a half times more massive than Jupiter, and its surface absorbs light better than charcoal. It might also have a faint dark red glow because of its burning air, which is as hot as fresh lava. Lovely. In the star system of 55 Cancri, there are five planets, four of which are gas giants similar to Jupiter and Saturn. But the fifth one, or rather the first, because it's closest to the star, is different in a most horrible way. 55 Cancri E is so close to its sun that half the planet's surface is a literal ocean of molten lava. The other half is in eternal darkness because it never sees the sun. The planet is always turned to its star on one side. And between the scorching and the dark, there's the twilight zone, a thin strip of gloomy nothingness. That's a getaway spot. HD 189377b – well, I'm not going to say that again – is the only exoplanet in the orbit of its star. And at first glance, it looks quite pretty – blue and white swirls making up wondrous patterns on the surface. But these pleasant colors actually come from hard silicate particles in the planet's atmosphere, which means it rains glass here. But the worst is that winds reach the speed of 5,400 miles per hour, or almost Mach 7. Well. For comparison, the fastest wind speed on Earth was 254 miles per hour, over 20 times less. 
Thus, the glass falling from the sky travels horizontally at hypersonic speeds, shredding everything in its path. Better duck! The next system, whose name I won't even try to pronounce, um, this one, has three exoplanets, which are all being slowly destroyed by their own star. It happens because that star is not a regular. It's a pulsar, a rapidly spinning core of an exploded star. It creates powerful electromagnetic pulses in several directions while rotating at several thousand times per second. As a result, the planets orbiting this deceased star are slowly being eaten away and will eventually disappear entirely. Kepler 70, hey, I can say that one, is a hot blue dwarf star that exploded into a red giant some 18 million years ago. At the time, it was orbited by at least two planets, the closer of which was a Jupiter-like gas giant. Its name was Kepler 70b, and it still exists. But the overgrown star consumed it and transformed it into a blazing hot rocky world. Right now, it's one of the hottest planets ever discovered. Its temperature is higher than the surface of our sun. It was lucky to survive spending time inside the star, but it's evaporating now and will probably be no more in the near future. WASP-12b is one of the weirdest and saddest planets out there. The enormous gravity of its star, combined with the planets consisting mostly of gas, result in the star slowly devouring its protege. Uh, so pal, like, uh, what's eating you? My mother. WASP-12b has already taken the form of an egg, stretched toward its merciless sun, and it's unable to do anything with its condition. In another 10 million years, the planet will inevitably succumb to the voracious star's appetite. Hey, you asked. If you ever wondered what it's like to walk on ice and hot coals at the same time, Gliese 436b is a planet that would give you a vivid example. Being extremely close to its sun, the Neptune-sized exoplanet boasts temperatures hotter than a blazing oven. And yet, it's covered in ice, which burns incessantly. This ice is much denser due to the enormous gravity of the planet, staying solid even under extreme conditions and not melting away. No list of frightening worlds could do without mentioning Venus, the Earth's evil twin. <laughs> the second planet from the Sun has an atmosphere so thick and full of clouds that its surface is much hotter than that of Mercury. Volcanic eruptions constantly thrash Venus, its gravity is almost a hundred times stronger than ours, and those clouds I mentioned are not made of water, but of sulfuric acid, which condenses and rains down on the ground, adding to the inferno. But even if you were brave, or crazy, enough to try to pass through these clouds, you probably couldn't. The winds up there are as strong as some of the most powerful hurricanes back on Earth. Here we have a very long name for a very, very cold planet. Although the host star is not too far away, it's a small and rather cool red dwarf whose light and heat barely even reach the planet. The temperatures out there fall as low as minus 370 degrees, which is only marginally warmer than absolute zero. The exoplanet is thus dark, gloomy, and covered in eternal ice that never thaws. I thought I thaw that, Thumworth. Still, if it has a rocky core, it might generate some heat. So there's a chance that deep below the frozen surface, some unknown alien things might lurk. Dimidium, located roughly 50 light years away from our solar system, is a planet hostile to any living thing on many accounts. It's tidally locked to its sun, which means one of its sides is always facing the star, while the other is always turned away. The hot side is heated to over 1800 degrees, perpetually blown over with winds reaching 600 miles per hour. And that's winter! Well, actually, I don't know that. Despite Dimidium being a gas giant, it has a large amount of iron in it, which melts and evaporates in the atmosphere, creating clouds. And when those cool down, they fall on the surface in the infernal rain of molten iron. That'll test your metal. Oxygen is usually viewed as an element that might bring life to a planet, but this is definitely not the case for Osiris. Scientists were shocked to find oxygen on this planet, or rather around it, because it's eight times closer to its star than Mercury is to the Sun. This extreme distance makes Osiris a living melting pot, where anything that could burn will. 
It's also responsible for a very short orbit of the planet around the star. A year on Osiris is just three and a half days on Earth. To boot, the atmosphere of the planet is constantly blown and melted away by the heat from its sun. Vacation? Nah, let's keep looking. Karat Exo 3b is neither as hot nor as cold as some of the others on this list, but it's terrifying in its own more insidious way. It's a gas giant similar in size to Jupiter, yet 20 times denser. This makes this exoplanet's gravity weigh down on everything on its surface 50 times more than it would on Earth. Stepping on it would be your ultimate doom, because you'd be immediately crushed by the density of its atmosphere. Karat 7b is another oven-like world. Its day-to-day -day temperature is over 4,000 degrees. Combined with the rocky surface, it presents an infernal landscape. The rocks on the ground bubble and boil, evaporating in the atmosphere, where they cool down and eventually fall back on the surface in a brimstone rain. The saddest thing about Karat 7b is that it might have once been a gas giant whose atmosphere melted away from the heat, leaving only the scorched core. This tool is always available, 24 sevenths. It improves your accuracy and reduces the number of errors. It can perform boring and repetitive tasks instead of you. You've probably guessed that I'm talking about artificial intelligence. But what if I also told you that it has the potential to make humanity disappear? Leading computer scientists and technologists are worried. They believe AI poses a risk of extinction to our civilization. And it's so serious that the situation calls for global action. Experts claim that super-powerful AI systems can only be developed after we become confident that their effects will be positive and risks manageable. AI is advancing so fast these days that it has raised concerns about the potential negative consequences of such rapid development. They might range from mass job losses and copyright infringements to instability in different spheres and the spread of misinformation. There are also those who are afraid that people will one day lose control of the technology altogether. The thing is, current AI has yet to achieve AGI, which stands for Artificial General Intelligence. But once it reaches this stage, it will potentially be able to make independent decisions doesn't it sound truly terrifying? But the most alarming thing, researchers at Microsoft say that GPT-4 has shown sparks of AGI. It turned out to be capable of solving difficult tasks spanning math, coding, medicine, psychology, law, and many other fields. And it didn't need any particular prompting while doing this. So are we on the road to super intelligence? And why are most people not worried about it? might be because we are confused about the very term AI. Most people associate AI with sci-fi movies and don't realize it's our reality now. Nowadays, AI is a broad topic. It ranges from our smartphones to self-driving cars to something that can change our future dramatically and irrevocably. Let's clear things up. We should stop thinking of AI as robots. A robot is just a container for AI. Sometimes they might mimic the human form, sometimes they don't. But AI itself is inside. AI is the brain, not the body, if it has any. Have you ever used, let's say, Siri? I bet if you're an iPhone owner, you have. So Siri is an AI, and the voice you hear is a personification of that AI. And guess what? There's no robot involved whatsoever. Now, back to the dangers AI might present. There's a chance that soon, AI chatbots will become more intelligent than humans. And then, AI may start, or be used, to generate misinformation capable of destabilizing society. In the worst case scenario, however unrealistic it may sound, machines might become so intelligent that they will take over the world, which would lead to the extinction of humankind. There are other, no less pressing concerns. For example, AI could start playing a big role in making decisions affecting our lives. Imagine people becoming so dependent on AI that they can't live without its advice and guidance. They rely on it in all spheres of their lives, 
from buying groceries to choosing a vacation destination to picking a name for their child. Sounds scary, doesn't it? Lots of jobs, more than 300 million all over the world, will be, and already are, at risk because of AI. It happens as certain tasks and job functions become automated. This tendency might also affect administrative jobs, the legal sphere, architecture, management, and more. At the same time, we must acknowledge that AI is beneficial for many sectors. Experts predict a 7% increase in global GDP thanks to it. For example, some areas of science and medicine are already taking advantage of AI, developing new medicines and treating some diseases. For the time being, countries are trying to pass special AI-related legislation. It's supposed to classify AI into four risk-based categories, deal with fakes and make companies register their algorithms with regulators. The extreme conditions of the inner Earth make it impossible to explore this mysterious underground world. People have been to the moon. Robots have been exploring Mars. The New Horizons space probe snapped photos of Pluto billions of miles away. And still, we don't know for sure what lies about 4,000 miles beneath our feet. Incredible heat and unfathomable pressure keep the center of Earth out of reach. But scientists have found a way out. They examine seismic waves during earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, as well as light waves coming from the sun. And these observations help them to reveal pretty fascinating insights about the insides of our planet. Our planet is like an onion, with four different layers. They are the crust, mantle, outer core, and inner core. There are also transition zones between these layers. The top one is Earth's crust. It's like a hard-boiled egg shell, thin and tough. It takes up less than 1% of the planet's mass and is between 3 to 40 miles thick. People have drilled pretty deep holes in Earth's crust, but they were never deep enough to get all the way through the crust. After the drills traveled one-third of the way, the temperatures got too high and the equipment couldn't operate any longer. The crust is broken into tectonic plates. They let heat escape from Earth's interior. The next layer is the mantle. It's about 1,800 miles thick and makes nearly 84% of the planet's volume. The mantle consists of white-hot silicate rocks rich in iron and magnesium. If you managed to get your hands on a chunk of our planet's mantle and cooled it to room temperature, you'd get speckled olive green material. It would also contain garnets, beautiful red cubic minerals. Deeper in the mantle, this substance turns into two new minerals, which become yellow and brownish orange at room temperature. The 1,400 mile thick outer core is liquid. It consists of iron and nickel, but the pressure there isn't high enough for it to solidify. If you reach the boundary between the outer and inner core, you'd experience temperatures of more than 9,000 degrees F, which is almost as hot as the surface of the sun. And the pressure there is 3.6 million times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. The inner core is a solid ball made of iron and nickel with a radius of around 760 miles. It makes 20% of Earth's and 70% of the Moon's radius. But let's figure out how we found out all these details. When the tectonic plates making up Earth's crust move past one another, they tend to catch and break. This, along with the waves of energy coming with the process, is what we call an earthquake. It creates sound waves that are too low for the human ear to hear. But with the help of special equipment, scientists can figure out when and where an earthquake has occurred. When earthquakes send ground vibrations throughout our planet, these waves travel across the world in different ways, and they can offer us a glimpse of what's below. Researchers use computer modeling to create images of what's inside Earth. Now, you probably think that Earth's magnetic field is created by a big ball of solid iron in the middle of the planet that is the inner core, right? But the problem is that in the inner core, the temperatures are so high that the very magnetism of iron itself is changed. Once such a temperature, which is called the Curie point, is reached, atoms aren't able to align to a magnetic point anymore. So, in reality, Earth's magnetic field is created by the swirling outer core. 
Magnetism there is more than 50 times greater than it is on the surface. The liquid iron in the outer core conducts electricity perfectly, which helps it create electrical currents driving the magnetic field. Without it, our planet wouldn't be able to hold on to its atmosphere. As a result, we'd lose our main protection from extremely dangerous space radiation. Black holes are terrifyingly dense space objects, pulling inside everything that comes too close. Nothing can escape their clutches, even a beam of light. At the same time, black holes are some of the most mysterious objects in the universe. According to their mass, black holes are usually divided into three categories. Stellar black holes have a mass from a few to hundreds of times the mass of the Sun. Intermediate black holes should range from 100 to hundreds of thousands of times the Sun's mass. Scientists are now actively hunting these missing link black mysteries. But the real behemoths of the cosmos are supermassive black holes. They have hundreds of thousands to billions of times the mass of our Sun. Most supermassive black holes lie in the centers of their home galaxies. You can probably say that they sit in the gravitational driving seat. Meanwhile, hundreds of billions of stars, planets, and moons orbit them. Let's have a look at the biggest black holes astronomers have found so far. NGC 6166 is a monster that has grown to have a mass of 30 billion solar masses. It's actually an elliptical galaxy that has an active nucleus in the center. It's also one of the most luminous sources of X-rays. The galaxy's supermassive black hole powers two symmetric radio jets in the opposite direction, which is the result of the infall of gas into its center. Another peculiar thing about NGC 6166 is that it shows a blue shift, which means it's moving toward us. The next supermassive black hole is located in the constellation of Draco, approximately 10.4 gigalight years from us. The mass of this supergiant is more than 30 billion solar masses. Besides being incredibly massive, the black hole is also really big. If it replaced our sun, the diameter of this hole would extend to the orbit of Pluto. This S5 Theora1481 is one of the most interesting black holes on our list. It has a mass of 40 billion solar masses and is actually a blazer, the most energetic of all quasars, which are super bright distant objects. The blazar's luminosity is 300 trillion times that of the sun and more than 25,000 times as great as the luminosity of all 100 to 400 billion stars of the Milky Way galaxy combined. But since the distance to this quasar is about 12.1 billion light years, we can't see it directly. But we know that the central black hole of the quasar consumes huge amounts of matter, about 4,000 solar masses of material every year. Phi C1101 is a supergiant elliptical galaxy. It's the most massive known galaxy so far. Since this galaxy is elliptical, it isn't filled with gas. That's why the star formation in that region is very low. As for the black hole at the center of IC 1101, it has a mass of 40 to 100 billion solar masses and emits clear radio signals. Recently, astronomers have discovered a gravitational space wonder that has swollen to really unimaginable proportions. The black hole I'm talking about is Ton 618, and it's a mind-boggling 66 billion solar masses. The thing is so massive that astronomers had to think of a new term to describe it. They came up with an ultramassive black hole. Imagine gathering all the stars in our home Milky Way galaxy and squishing the matter they're made of into one black hole. And it still won't be enough to create a ton 618. If this monster of a black hole replaced the sun, its radius would be more than 40 times the size of Neptune's orbit. You probably know that black holes are made of matter packed together as densely as possible. And still, it doesn't mean that black holes are some kind of space predator, roaming galaxies and munching on everything they come across. Ton 618 still has a whole galaxy filled with stars and other stuff happily orbiting it without getting pulled inside. 
What I want to say is that the perception of black holes as giant vacuum cleaners is wrong. In reality, it's incredibly hard to grow a black hole. Try to do it and you'll see. Time runs like a river. It has direction, always advancing. It has a certain duration, periods between events you can measure. Time feels real, always there, unstoppable, moving forward. But what if I told you that time might not exist? Some physicists and philosophers claim that there might be no such concept as time, and we should take this possibility of the non-existence of time seriously. You see, recently physics has been in crisis. For the past century or so, two extremely successful physical theories have been used to explain the universe. Those are the theory of general relativity and quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics describes how things work in the super tiny world of particles and their interactions. As for general relativity, it provides an outlook on the bigger picture, for example, gravity or how objects move in space. And even though both of these theories seem to be working really well, they are believed to conflict with one another. That's why some scientists think that they need to be replaced with a new, more general theory, like quantum gravity. This idea might be able to explain how gravity works at the miniature scale of particles. Apparently, it's incredibly difficult to produce the theory of quantum gravity, but it might be possible to do it with the help of string theory. It replaces particles with strings, vibrating in 11 dimensions. But there's one problem. Even though string theories do provide several models describing the universe, they don't make any clear predictions that can be tested by experiments to understand which model is the correct one. There's one more idea known as loop quantum gravity. According to it, the fabric of space and time is made of super tiny chunks, loops. But the most remarkable aspect of this theory is that it completely eliminates the concept of time. Now suppose this idea turns out to be correct. Will it mean that time doesn't exist? Well, the answer is kinda complicated. Everything depends on what the word exist means. A philosophy professor from Cambridge University claims that the three basic properties of time, a present moment that is special, the flow of time and its direction, come from our mental states and not from the physical world. So we sense this arrow of time because our minds add a certain subjective ingredient to reality. At the same time, Einstein's theory of relativity supports the idea of the block universe, a four-dimensional space-time structure where time is like space. It has its own coordinates in space-time. Time is tenseless there. Thus, the future and past are as real as the present. Does it mean we're being fooled by our human perspectives? Is the feeling that time passes and has a certain direction false? Well, we can imagine our world as a three-dimensional place where stuff happens gradually over time. Or it might be a four-dimensional space where nothing actually happens because nothing changes. It's all here at the same time, past, present, and future. The main idea of relativity is that there's no absolute space and no absolute time. Everything is relative. Trying to think about time in the context of the universe, you realize that you need to isolate part of it and call it, let's say, your watch. And time is basically the relationship between some parts of the universe and that thing you called your watch. Another scientist says that time is just a collection of snapshots describing our reality while continuously changing one into another. Here, you hit play. Here, you're blinking while watching this video. And here, you're taking a sip of your coffee. Without these changes, there wouldn't be any notion of time. The changes are real, but time is not. Our brain sees these changes and constructs a sense of time, believing that it's flowing. What do you think? Is time just a social construct, or does it really exist? You're dashing through space in your state-of-the-art spaceship. It's the year 3023, and by now, people have figured out how to travel at the speed of light. Your equipment works properly and doesn't show anything out of the ordinary. But suddenly, you feel it. An overwhelming pull. 
you check the region of space you're traveling through and see something that makes your hair stand on end. You're heading straight into the heart of a supermassive black hole. You didn't notice it before because these space monsters have such an immense gravitational pull that even light can't escape their clutches. So they're literally black. What happens next is hard to describe. Time and space are getting warped. But you can't understand what's happening to you and your spaceship. Normally, your story would finish here. But for some unfathomable reason, you survive and are spewed with great force in... Actually, you have no idea where you are. But what you do understand is that a black hole wouldn't let you go so easily. So, what on earth is this thing you've just left? Could it be... a white hole? This is a theoretical cosmic region functioning in the opposite way to a black hole. While nothing can escape a black hole, nothing can enter a white hole. You turn around. The white hole, if it really is a white hole, looks exactly like a black one. Your equipment shows that it has a certain mass. It also seems to be spinning. You also spot a faint disk of dust and gas gathered around the event horizon, a bubble boundary separating the insides of the white hole from the rest of the universe. Then, you witness something incredible. A belch. That's when you finally realize you might be the first person to find a real white hole. While the event horizon of a black hole prevents stuff from escaping in white holes, this boundary doesn't let things enter it. And if we assume that black holes don't destroy any information that gets inside, there must be a way for this information to come back out. So can this something helping information escape be a white hole? So far, white holes are only a theory. You can imagine them as black holes in reverse. Another question is how white holes might form. One of the most popular theories claims that a white hole could be a black hole that has almost collapsed in on itself and then exploded outward again. No one has seen it, obviously. But inside a black hole, there might be a long tube. It gets longer and narrower until it reaches the point in which it gets so narrow that quantum effects make it bounce back. And then this super long and super narrow tube starts getting thicker and wider again. And that's how a white hole is born. But what could make a black hole want to turn itself inside out? Quantum mechanics states that many things we perceive as continuous are actually granular. For example, let's take light. It's not a continuous wave, it's made up of photons. So if we apply quantum mechanics to space itself, we'll find out that the cosmos is granular too. It means a black hole can't squeeze stuff down to infinity. At some point it will reach its minimum size. And this matter, or whatever is falling down the black hole, will have to stop and bounce back, giving birth to a white hole. What matter might a white hole spit out? Some experts think it could be ordinary electromagnetic radiation. It'd probably be unrecognizable from what originally fell into the black hole since things get horrendously squashed after entering black holes. Black holes are known to absorb everything, matter and energy. As for white holes, they would expel everything, almost like anti-gravity, endlessly ejecting material. To discover a white hole, we probably need to look for a place where matter would be ejected with enormous force and a lot of energy. The main question of all time goes like this. What was there before the Big Bang? The most common theory claims that about 13.7 billion years ago, before this incredible rapid expansion occurred, the universe existed as a singularity. It was a point tinier than a subatomic particle. At least, that's what the Big Bang theory tells us. Okay, but what was before that? This question has been bothering the minds of the greatest cosmologists for at least 1,600 years. For example, 4th century theologian St. Augustine was trying to figure out the answer to the question of what had existed before the universe was created. He made a conclusion that the phrase, in the beginning, mentioned in the Bible, implied that nothing had existed before that. He also believed that time and the universe had been created simultaneously. The ancient Greeks were also bothered by the same question and kept debating the origin of time. Philosopher and scientist Aristotle, for instance, took the no-beginning side. He thought that nothing could come out of nothing. In other words, to get a universe, you need to have something for this universe to appear from. 
And since the universe couldn't have gone from nothingness to somethingness, it must have existed forever. That's why time must stretch eternally into the past and future. In the early 20th century, the world got to know about Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. According to this theory, mass warps time, making it run a bit more slowly for, let's say, a human standing on Earth's surface and a satellite orbiting our planet. Based on Einstein's work, other ideas started to pop up, including the one that stated that the universe started as a singularity and expanded through the Big Bang. Then, quantum physics came into play. It gave birth to a bunch of new theories, which brought forth the questions about the pre-Big Bang universe again. And aren't these ideas fascinating? Some researchers believe that our universe is just an offspring of another much older universe. According to them, the evidence for this theory can be found in the Cosmic Microwave Background, CMB, which is the relic radiation left over from the Big Bang. But let me explain. For the first time, astronomers observed the Cosmic Microwave Background in 1965. At that time, they didn't know it would soon create problems for the Big Bang Theory, challenging its ideas and postulates. Now. According to the inflation theory, an extremely rapid expansion of the universe occurred in the very first moments of its existence. This theory accounts for the changes in temperature and density in the CMB. It also claims that these fluctuations should be uniform. But recent mapping results show that the universe is actually lopsided. More fluctuations occur in some areas than in others. This makes some scientists believe that our universe bubbled off a parent universe. There's also a chaotic inflation theory, which takes this concept even further. It believes in an endless progression of bubbles, each eventually becoming a universe. And each of these appearing universes gives birth to even more bubbles, which results in an immeasurable multiverse. There are other models too. Some of them revolve around the pre-Big Bang singularity and black holes. If we think of these space monsters as cosmic trash compactors, they might end up being the main candidates for primordial compression. And our rapidly expanding universe could be a white hole output from a black hole dwelling in another universe. A white hole is a hypothetical object that acts in the opposite way to a black hole. Instead of pulling everything inside, it constantly gives off energy and matter. There's also the Big Bounce Theory. Its main idea is that instead of going through one Big Bang, the universe expands and contracts in a cycle, bouncing back every time it shrinks to a certain size. Each cycle, therefore, begins with a tiny, smooth universe that gradually grows, becoming more warped with time. And eventually, it starts to collapse, smoothing itself out before starting anew. If you liked or disliked our video, put a like or dislikes. Leave comments. Let's discuss the mysteries of the universe together. And now don't leave, the video will continue. The universe is expanding. And if it's expanding, then it probably had a beginning somewhere. Now all we have to do is to run time backward and see where the beginning was. It took the scientists many more years to come up with a full-fledged theory. The Big Bang Theory. And here it is. Nothing has ever been anywhere, because neither when nor where existed. But actually, no. There was one thing. It was the so-called cosmic singularity, a state of our universe in which it was incredibly small, dense, and very, very hot. Imagine if our universe was compressed into a small ball. The pressure and temperature inside would be enormous. At some point, it became impossible to withstand them. And here comes the Big Bang. It was an outburst of energy and matter that created everything we see now. Time and space, basic physical forces. It also scattered quarks everywhere. These quarks, tiny particles that make up our world, were all boiling in an incredibly hot cosmic broth. When it cooled down, gravity began to attract them to each other. They gathered into atoms, then molecules, and then into the first objects in the world. Stars. What was before that? Alan Harvey Guth, an American theoretical physicist and cosmologist, has devoted his whole life to solving this mystery. 
After learning about the Big Bang Theory, Guth found some flaws in it. For example, the distribution of matter was very even, although it shouldn't have been. If we drop the balloon filled with paint down, it will burst, and we'll see absolute chaos on the canvas. But the early universe don't look like. The early universe was very even and proportional. That was Guth's discovery, the theory of inflation. Here's what it says. Even before the Big Bang, there was some kind of force that could give the bang a strong acceleration, something that was able to distribute everything in space instantly and evenly. Martin Boyovald is a German professor of physics, and in his opinion, the universe was born quite differently. According to Martin's theory, the singularity couldn't just appear out of nowhere. Let's look at a pendulum on the old clock. The pendulum rotates back and forth. Its movement is smooth, continuous, and non-stop. This is how we usually see time. It flows and never stops. But quantum time doesn't work that way. It consists of small segments and makes short pauses. And just like with the second hand of a clock, the beginning of one segment of time is always the end of another. According to the Big Bang Theory, once upon a time, our universe began to expand, inflate like a balloon. But sooner or later, it will blow away back. The universe will start shrinking and return to the state of cosmic singularity. And then, the Big Bang too. Nothing appears out of nowhere and disappears into nowhere. According to Boyovald's theory, the beginning of each universe is the end of the previous one. Our universe is not at all the first and not the last. Millions of similar universes existed before us and will exist after us. This theory, although it sounds very logical, is far from complete. So for now, all this is just a hypothesis. But some people come up with even stranger ideas. Neil Turok, a South African physicist, and his colleague Paul Steinhardt an American theoretical physicist. They say that yes, our universe isn't the first one. Our universe is just one of an infinite number of others. And all of us are stuck in a cycle of endless rebirths of parallel worlds. According to this theory, our universe is located inside a so-called brain, as in membrane. In other words, we're stuck in some kind of elastic surface that's capable of contracting, stretching, oscillating, and so on, like pieces of fabric on a rope. Another universe may be an inch from ours, but we can't see it. That's because there's a tiny space between us, and this tiny space contains the fourth dimension. How do these universes originate? Through brain collision. These brains are getting closer to each other very, very slowly, until they finally collide. Their collision creates two big bangs and two parallel universes. Then they're moving away from each other, the created worlds continue to live. We're currently at this stage. Remember the inflation theory? There was a mysterious energy that pushed and accelerated the Big Bang. Well, if we did collide with another universe, that would explain everything. Which idea is closer to you? How about the idea of subscribing? Subscribe. Titan is Saturn's largest moon. It's also the second largest moon in the solar system, after Jupiter and Ganymede. And it's the only moon with clouds and a dense planet-like atmosphere. But the coolest thing? This moon might help us understand how life appeared on Earth. And for us to understand whether you like such videos or not, please put a like and subscribe to the channel. Your support is important to us. Thank you. Astronomers say that the conditions on Titan might be almost the same as those on Earth in its early years. The only significant difference is that, being closer to the Sun, Earth has always been warmer. Titan is surrounded by an orange haze, which had kept the Moon's surface a mystery for astronomers up until 2004. That's when the Cassini mission arrived there. Now we know that Titan's atmosphere extends about 370 miles high. That's a lot higher than the atmosphere of our planet. Because of this atmosphere, Titan was believed to be the largest moon in the solar system for a long time. But the most exciting fact about Titan's atmosphere is that it's full of organic compounds. If they were discovered on our planet, they would definitely mean life. 
Now, the atmosphere of Titan is mostly nitrogen mixed with a bit of methane and other organic compounds, which form when sunlight destroys methane. But if sunlight keeps destroying methane, how does this gas appear in the atmosphere again and again? On Earth, it's life itself that restores the supply of methane, since it's a byproduct of the metabolism of many organisms. So, can we conclude there's life on Titan? This distant moon isn't the most pleasant place to settle down. It's too cold for liquid water to exist on its surface. And still, Titan has rivers, seas, and lakes of liquid hydrocarbons, such as methane and ethane. The largest of them are hundreds of feet deep and hundreds of miles wide. Beneath the thick crust of the moon, there is a more liquid ocean consisting primarily of water rather than methane. After a series of laboratory simulations, scientists concluded that there might be enough organic material on Titan for a chemical evolution to begin. It could be similar to the one that started life on Earth. But for that to happen, there must be liquid water on the moon for longer periods of time than what we observe now. And still, it might be another proof supporting the idea of a liquid water ocean under the frozen isolation layer. If it was true, Titan's subsurface ocean could turn out to be a place harboring life as we know it. Meanwhile, its lakes and seas of liquid hydrocarbons could have forms of life with different chemistry than what we're used to. Or there may be no life at all. After all, the temperature on the surface of Saturn's moon is about 290 OF. These conditions are far from comfortable for almost any life form. According to one theory, a meteorite impact that occurred a long, long time ago could have provided enough heat to liquefy water for around a few hundred or thousand years. But right now? Most experts think that Titan isn't likely to be a place where life thrives, which makes the presence of methane in the moon's atmosphere even more puzzling. Interestingly, Titan might become warmer in the future. You see, five to six billion years from now, the sun will become a red giant. It will heat up most space objects in our solar system, and Titan will become warmer, 94 OF. This temperature is high enough for stable oceans of a water-ammonia mixture to exist on its surface. With time, the sun's ultraviolet output will decrease, which will enable the greenhouse effect in Titan's upper atmosphere. The combination of these conditions might exist for several hundred million years, creating an environment suitable for the appearance of exotic forms of life. After all, this time was enough for life to evolve on Earth. The only thing that might hinder the process on Titan could be the presence of ammonia. It's likely to cause the same chemical reactions to proceed more slowly. Two decades ago, in 1999, we stumbled upon a unique diamond-like celestial object. This asteroid was named Ryugu, derived from a Japanese word meaning Dragon Palace. The name originates from a Japanese legend about an enchanting underwater palace. In this tale, a fisherman ventures to this palace, riding a turtle and comes back bearing a peculiar box. Echoing this story, the Japanese spacecraft journeyed to Ryugu around two years ago, retrieving enigmatic samples from its surface. The asteroid's terrain, dotted with craters and stones, suggests a tumultuous history. The spacecraft retrieved a specimen from Ryugu's surface, and upon its return to Earth, scientists made a fascinating discovery. The asteroid predates our own solar system. The mission aimed to procure this sample to shed more light on the beginnings of our solar system. However, this isn't the inaugural discovery of such ancient particles. Similar grains have been identified in various meteorites before. They often contain a significant amount of carbon, akin to Ryugu. Yet, Ryugu possesses a distinct composition not found on Earth. Silicon carbide, a pure blend of silicon and carbon. The composition of Ryugu is so distinct that it suggests the asteroid originated in the outer realms of the solar system. It is one of the trio of asteroids that, while revolving around the Sun, maintain a proximity to Earth. Essentially, these asteroids are clusters of fragmented rocks bound together by their mutual gravitational pull. They are believed to have come into existence after larger celestial bodies collided, breaking into smaller fragments. The individual stones of Ryugu could date back as far as 4.6 billion years, hinting at their origin from a parent entity. 
However, some theories propose that the asteroid's surface might be a relatively younger 158 million years old. How can we determine the age of our solar system? Billions of years ago, in a distant and nearly lost section of the Milky Way, existed a molecular cloud. Like many others throughout the cosmos, it began to disintegrate and collapse, a natural process leading to the birth of stars. From this particular cloud, several stars emerged. One of them, slightly secluded from the rest, began gathering surrounding materials, evolving into what we term a protoplanetary disk. This rotating disk of gas and dust encircled what would eventually become the nucleus of a solar system. Over time, this disk gave rise to various celestial entities, including asteroids and planets. Eventually, our Sun, eight planets, and various other celestial objects that we recognize today as our solar system emerged from it. This system is estimated to be around 4.6 billion years old, over spans ranging from hundreds of thousands to millions of years post the star's emergence, planets begin to take shape. While many celestial bodies from that era may have vanished, the configuration of our solar system has largely remained consistent since its inception. By analyzing the constituents of various objects, researchers have uncovered fascinating insights as they examine minerals, stones, and solid entities. The elemental makeup of these objects provides clues about their age. Scientists have investigated meteorites that have fallen to Earth. Believing these meteorites and Earth belong to a shared system, they estimated their age to be around 4.54 billion years. Lunar rocks, which haven't undergone the same transformations as terrestrial ones, are younger by several million years. The Sun, our solar system's core star, might be slightly older, perhaps by tens of millions of years compared to the oldest rocks. The general sequence is stars forming first, followed by planets and other solid entities. So it's plausible that the Sun is nearing 4.6 billion years in age. Among the known moons in our solar system and beyond, Jupiter's moon Callisto stands out as the oldest. It's a rugged, icy body marked with numerous craters, indicating its history of collisions over its believed four billion years of existence. These craters suggest it's been a target for space debris for quite some time. Moons like Callisto around Jupiter likely originated from the remnants left after Jupiter's formation. While these durations sound vast, consider that the universe itself is approximately 13.7 billion years old, hinting at even older entities existing out there. Recently, astronomers identified one such ancient and distant entity, the galaxy, located 12.8 billion light years away. This galaxy began its formation just a billion years after the universe's inception, shortly after the Big Bang set everything into motion. Wait, please subscribe. When a team of astronomers embarked on an ambitious project to craft a comprehensive 3D depiction of our galaxy, they anticipated standard findings. Yet, they stumbled upon something completely unexpected. Dr. Anna Banaka, a distinguished scientist from Harvard, detected an unusual interference in the stellar streams of our galaxy. These stellar streams are essentially pathways of stars that traverse galaxies in unison. The specific stream in focus, named GD1, spans a remarkable distance across our celestial canvas. Historically, this stream maintained a consistent line, molded by the galaxy's gravitational pull. However, Dr. Banaka observed an anomaly, a gap with an irregular outline. It appeared as though a massive entity had recently burst through GD1, its gravitational prowess pulling stars along its path. Intriguingly, telescopes couldn't pinpoint what caused this disruption. The burning question then was, what could this invisible force possibly be? I hope this unknowable force doesn't stop you from clicking the subscribe button, giving it a like and hitting the bell. Your support is very important. Thank you. There's a hypothesis that an unfamiliar star could be the culprit. However, Dr. Bonica believes that the size of this disturbance is much larger than any known star. It would need to be a staggering million times the mass of our sun. But let's consider another possibility. 
What if a gargantuan black hole, akin to the one at our galaxy's core, caused this disruption in the Milky Way? If two such black holes neared each other, they might get trapped in their mutual gravitational pull, leading to a potential catastrophic collision. Then the stronger of the two holes would consume the weaker one, and one huge super mighty black hole would appear. But people have yet to witness a collision of black holes. Plus, scientists can't predict the consequences of such a merge, even though they've simulated it on powerful computers. The only obvious fact is that it would produce incredible amounts of energy. Huge ripples would travel through the entire universe, bound to hit our planet eventually. Then again, two black holes in one galaxy might refuse to merge. Imagine this: a supermassive black hole, hundreds of millions of times the mass of the sun, is spinning in the center of the Milky Way at a phenomenal speed. Another spinning black hole approaches ours. What do you think will happen? Right, one of the holes, most likely the intruder, will get kicked out and sent hurtling away like a frisbee flying through space. And who can guarantee that it wouldn't head toward the Earth? Luckily for us, there aren't any supermassive black holes in the vicinity, so this theory fails to explain the mysterious bullet hole phenomenon. Dr. Bonica still doesn't rule out the possibility that the intruder is some kind of luminous star-like object. After tearing a hole in the Milky Way, it could be hiding somewhere in the galaxy. But again, it seems highly unlikely because of the object's huge size. I mean, we're talking 30 to 65 light years across. I, I, in any case, predicting the location of this mysterious intruder is as challenging as guessing where your missing sock disappears to after laundry day. Speaking of things disappearing, don't let this channel vanish from your feed. Hit that subscribe button. The intruder could have been blazing fast, requiring minimal mass to cause such a disturbance in the stellar stream, or it could have been a slower, massive behemoth. Astronomers are still scratching their heads, which just goes to show that some mysteries are harder to unravel than others. There are eight planets in our solar system, and they're all very different from one another. That's why, if one day they unexpectedly and inexplicably turned into humans, these people wouldn't look alike, and their characters would differ dramatically. Let's try to imagine what humans the planets of the solar system would make. Do you like our videos? Write about it in the comments, and please subscribe to our channel. Let me introduce Mercury. It's a curious and swift teenager, around 13, 15 years old. He's always on the move and is a bit hard to pin down. He's into sports and tends not to walk but dash around. That's one of the reasons his knees and elbows are always scratched. He's just like the planet Mercury with all its countless craters. Now, meet Venus. It's a beautiful young lady in her mid twenties. She likes to keep her secrets, and her alluring beauty comes with a temperamental side. At parties, she easily attracts attention because of the mystery surrounding her. But those who dare strike up a conversation with this beauty soon realize that she's scorchingly direct and doesn't tolerate nonsense. Earth is in her late twenties. She is very pretty and extroverted, and has a nurturing, balanced personality. Forever the peacemaker, trying to maintain harmony. Earth is the one everyone turns to for advice and comfort. She has a pretty unusual hobby: collecting different life forms, like someone who always brings home stray animals. And if she feels that something or someone is a threat to her beloved pets, she can get furious. Mars is a cool guy in his early twenties. He's ginger and sturdy. He's that ambitious and a bit annoying younger brother living in Earth's shadow. But he doesn't give up and is determined to make a name for himself. He's a great fan of adventure and exploration, that very type who enjoys camping, wilderness, and slightly dangerous activities. His guilty pleasure is googling stories about ancient warriors. Jupiter is in his early fifties. He is that protective elder with a bigger-than-life personality. He is a respected head of a large family, known for his wisdom and jovial nature. He also loves to throw big parties that sometimes get out of hand. Saturn, an elegant lady in her late forties, is stylish and timeless. She is always the best-dressed person at any gathering. 
She's known for her beauty and has a calm, sophisticated demeanor. She loves accessories, especially elaborate rings. She's got quite a collection. Uranus is in his late 30s, and he has an unconventional, quirky personality. If you have a problem and need a different perspective on something, he's the one to go to. No wonder his planet counterpart has a unique axial tilt. Uranus isn't afraid to be different. He enjoys innovative and boundaries-pushing art, and some suspect he might be a hacker. Neptune is a thoughtful man in his early 40s. He's kind of a dreamer and probably the most creative one in the group. You can often find him lost in thought or swept away by music. He's almost always wearing his large blue headphones. He's very sensitive and has a high emotional intelligence. This quality draws others in. That's not all. Let's look at a space body that used to be a planet, Pluto. It's a very young teenager, quiet and often overlooked. But he has a surprising amount of depth. Despite his introverted nature, he has a group of close-knit friends. It might take time to get to know him, but those who gain his trust discover his different side, endearing and witty. The sun is a big boss. No one knows how old he is because he looks ageless. Rumor has it he frequents beauty clinics, but shh. The sun knows his worth and uniqueness. He's quite caring and nice to his subordinates. But he's also rather hot-tempered, and when he gets angry, he expresses his displeasure openly, often by throwing stuff. The moon is a shy 18-year-old girl. It's hard for her to make new friends. She prefers to keep close to the only friend she has, which is Earth. To her, Earth is a motherly figure who can protect and give valuable advice. The moon has some skin problems, which also makes her feel rather insecure. But don't worry, Earth is working on her confidence. What occurs when a star depletes its energy reserves? Interestingly, it balloons to a magnitude many times its original dimension. This happens because, as the star's core exhausts its hydrogen supply, it begins to shrink due to its gravitational pull. Yet, hydrogen fusion still persists in its outer layers. As the core shrinks and heats up, the external layers also get warmer, leading to their expansion, enlarging the star's radius. As it expands, the star consumes everything in its path, even possibly its own orbiting planets. Although astronomers have observed stars on the brink of, or just after, consuming planets, witnessing this event in action remained elusive. However, a groundbreaking discovery by researchers from various institutions revealed a star in the act of devouring a planet. Astonishingly, this cosmic drama unfolded not in a distant galaxy, but within our very own Milky Way, a mere 12,000 light years away. And the subscribe and like button is only a few centimeters away. Go ahead and click. Thank you. Astronomers observed an intense flare from a star whose mass ranges between 0.8 and 1.5 times that of our sun, located near the Aquila constellation, resembling an eagle. Its brightness skyrocketed to over 100 times its usual within just 10 days before diminishing rapidly. Intriguingly, this initial fiery burst was succeeded by a cooler, prolonged signal. This unique sequence hints at one possibility. A nearby planet was devoured by the star. Which planet met this fiery end? Experts suggest it might have been a scorching world, weighing anywhere from one to ten times that of Jupiter. Such celestial bodies are often referred to as hot Jupiters. These massive exoplanets, akin to our solar system's Jupiter, complete their orbit around their host stars in less than ten days. This particular planet had been inching closer to the star over time until it was irresistibly drawn into the star's atmosphere and eventually into its core. This cosmic dining event took place roughly between 10,000 and 15,000 years ago when the star had been shining for about 10 billion years. Despite its advanced age, the act of engulfing was shockingly swift, like a quick bite. This is in stark contrast to other hot Jupiters, which saw more of a gradual consumption by their stars. It's uncertain to the astronomers if this star has other planets in its orbit, possibly maintaining a safer radius. But even if such planets exist, it 
could be millennia before they end up on the star's menu. Regardless, with this newfound knowledge, astronomers are keen to spot more of these celestial feasts. One day, our very own planet and a chunk of our solar system will face a similar destiny. Everything familiar will vanish in the blink of an eye. But no need for immediate panic. This event is slated for about 5 billion years from now. That's the estimated timeline for the sun to exhaust its fuel and swell immensely, consuming the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Should humanity have settled on another celestial body by then, they'd have front row seats to this cosmic upheaval. The sun's luminosity would spike dramatically, casting off matter into the cosmos and potentially even consuming Earth in its fiery dance. This phase of the sun's life will span about 10 million years. Once the core temperature reaches 100 million K, a helium flash will occur, initiating the thermonuclear fusion process that synthesizes carbon and oxygen from helium. With this newfound energy source, the sun will shrink in size. After around 100, 110 million years, when the helium reserves deplete, the sun will undergo a tumultuous expansion of its outer layers, transforming into a red giant once again. This sun phase will be marked by intense flare-ups, with its luminosity at times exceeding its current level by 5,200 times. This will result from previously untouched helium remnants entering the thermonuclear reaction. The sun will remain in this state for about 20 million years. The sun's mass is insufficient for it to end its evolution in a supernova explosion. After traversing the red giant phase, thermal pulsations will cause its outer shell to be stripped away, forming a planetary nebula. At the heart of this nebula, a white dwarf will remain, a remnant of the sun's core. This object, incredibly hot and dense, will be comparable in size to Earth. Over countless millions and billions of years, our once radiant sun will cool and dim. This life cycle is typical of low to mid-mass stars. People have always been intrigued by the question of how the world could end. Many theories have been suggested, many ideas debunked. And now, in the age of science, rather dire predictions come from physics and math. For example, let's take the theory of the Big Rip. It claims that one day, the pull of the expansion of the universe may grow stronger than the force of gravity. The resulting catastrophe will tear apart everything in space, even terrifying black holes. After that, there will be just clouds of single, disconnected particles floating all over the universe. Before this happens, please subscribe to our channel and like this video. Your support is very important to us. Thank you. And now, Let's go into detail about this blood-chilling scenario. The cosmological model of the Big Rip is based on the idea that if the universe keeps accelerating in its expansion, it will one day reach the point where all the forces holding it together will be overcome by dark energy. Now let me explain. Everything on Earth and everything people have ever seen in space with the help of telescopes and other instruments is normal matter. It's made up of atoms and molecules and adds up to less than 5% of the universe. Around 68% of the universe is dark energy. Astronomers wouldn't even know the thing existed if, several decades ago, they hadn't found out that the expansion of the universe wasn't slowing down. Quite the opposite. It was accelerating. It meant that there had to be some enigmatic force that counteracted gravity. This force was later called dark energy. You might ask, but what about the remaining 27% of the universe? That's what we call dark matter, and it's another thing that confuses astronomers to no end. If dark energy is a force responsible for the expansion of the universe, invisible dark matter is responsible for the way galaxies are organized on grand scales. It is also supposed to explain how objects work together. Potential candidates for dark matter vary from strange particles to super-dim objects. If one day, the power of dark energy becomes stronger than gravitational, electromagnetic, and weak nuclear forces, 
the universe is very likely to simply come apart. One of the newest models of the Big Rip Theory was published in 2015, and in it, the date when the universe might meet its demise is specified. It's about 22 billion years from now. This hypothesis also says that as the expansion of the universe becomes infinite, its viscosity will decrease. Cosmological viscosity measures how resistant the universe is to expanding and contracting. Eventually, such changes will cause the destruction of the universe. The big rip will happen when dark energy overpowers gravity. At one point, it might become so strong that it will start ripping apart atoms. In other words, if the big rip theory is correct, one day, the world might come to the point where galaxies, stars, planets, and everything on them will be literally torn apart. This view might turn out to be really spectacular if there was anyone left to marvel at it. Powerful forces will break apart atoms and molecules. Electrons will split from atoms all the way down to quarks or even smaller pieces we don't know about yet. And then, everything will cease to exist. The Big Rip isn't the only scary theory about what the end of our universe might look like. Another popular hypothesis is the Big Crunch. It says that one day, the growth of the universe will slow down to a crawl, and then gravity will become the main force. It'll make the universe shrink, causing planets, stars, and galaxies to collide with one another. It'll be the Big Bang in reverse, with everything collapsing in on itself. And let's not forget about another creepy scenario, the Big Freeze. The universe is expanding faster and faster. One day, this growth will pull previously visible galaxies too far away, and we won't see them ever again. Many billions of years later, the universe will turn into a huge, dark, empty, and incredibly cold place with no movement at all. Have you heard of quantum immortality? These days, many people are confused about this notion. But if you believe in it, you also believe that you can live forever. How come? Well, quantum immortality claims that nobody ever disappears forever and that consciousness never passes away. Instead, once you cease to exist in one universe, your consciousness simply gets transferred to a parallel universe, and there, you survive. This idea sounds more like a sci-fi movie than something that real science can suggest. It could be a script for a blockbuster. People's consciousness can transfer from one world, where an apocalyptic event has wiped out all life, to another, where such an event has never occurred. And the only clues about the slight differences between these worlds are a few Mandela effects. This phenomenon is named after people disremembering Nelson Mandela's passing. These days, the term is used to refer to any collective false memories. So maybe in that new world, millions of people will be wondering, since when has Pizza Hut been written with two T's? But the thing is, in this new reality, this popular brand name has always had two of them. Imagine going through apocalypse after apocalypse, transferring to one world after another. It might be a nice, if a bit horrifying, thought that you're going to live forever. Instead of passing away completely, you'll just keep transferring to a universe where nothing tragic has happened to you. But is there anything to this theory? What does science think about such a possibility? In fact, the idea of quantum immortality has been around for quite some time. It has been seen both as untestable nonsense and as a curious thought experiment, like the one involving a cat. And here, I mean Schrodinger's cat. Let me explain. According to one of the interpretations of quantum mechanics, particles can exist in several states at the same time. But when a particle is being observed or measured, this system collapses. As a result, the particle is found in just one of its possible states. In 1933, Schrodinger suggested doing a certain thought experiment. He believed it would show the absurdity of this idea. In his hypothetical scenario, a cat was placed inside a box with radioactive materials. These substances had a 50-50 chance of decaying over an hour. If it happened, the radioactivity would be detected by a Geiger counter, which, in this case, would smash a vial with poison. As you might assume, it wouldn't end well for the cat. 
Schrodinger saw the following problem. The cat in the box would be both alive and not alive at the same time. The animal would be in this state for an hour, until someone opened the box and checked on the feline, either lifeless or very annoyed. One solution to this problem, known as the many worlds interpretation, gets around this situation by claiming that both outcomes take place. According to this hypothesis, all possible outcomes of quantum measurements occur across many universes, and their number might be infinite. It probably doesn't come as a surprise that this theory is often criticized. Many mention that this idea is unfalsifiable, since universes don't interact with one another, making the theory impossible to test. It's even been called one of the most implausible and unrealistic ideas ever. After all, it's not clear why your consciousness would get transferred between worlds just because you cease to exist in one of them. Unless it's a thought experiment, of course. It might provide you with the comfort of knowing that there is another you who doesn't pass away in a different world. But why should you believe that you only exist in the world where you're alive? What about the universe where you didn't make it? Like, what happens to your body? And speaking of the suggestion that you might understand that you're in a different universe thanks to Mandela effects, it's kind of the area of science fiction. Imagine humankind effectively colonizing the Red Planet. And you're one of the first people to brave this challenging journey. During the long, long flight, you entertain yourself with the thoughts of landing on Mars, getting a nice piece of land, building a house. Wait, wait, wait. The problem is you can't own anything in space. Broadly speaking, no one can own space. But this issue becomes more complex than that once you start looking into the particulars. Space is governed by a special agreement called the Outer Space Treaty. According to this treaty, outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, can't be subject to national appropriation, even by means of use or occupation. In other words, no nation can declare itself the owner of any part of space. So, that piece of land on Mars can't be yours. Space is declared to be the province of all humankind, but the contents in space are a different matter. For example, you might have a right to occupy a certain orbit. It means that you can place and keep your satellite in that orbital slot. Plus, when a nation registers its space object, it gets the right to exercise exclusive control over it. So, if one country built a moon base on the surface of Earth's natural satellite, this base would belong to this nation. But no one would be able to claim ownership over the land this moon station would stand on. But then, how about asteroid mining? Asteroids are rich in minerals, in particular, such metals as iron, nickel, gold, platinum, magnesium, palladium, and many others. According to NASA estimates, the value of asteroids that we could potentially exploit for resources could be worth as much as 700 quintillion dollars. And a quintillion is a number with 18 zeros. Who would be the owner of all that wealth? Well, the Moon Agreement obliges the participants to establish special procedures to control the exploitation of the natural resources of the Moon and other space bodies. But so far, it's still a bit unclear what rules this process will follow. In total, there are five international treaties related to space law. They're all overseen by the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, on Copuos. You've already heard of the Outer Space Treaty. It's the foundation of international space law, and here are its principles for space exploration and operation. First of all, space activities should benefit all nations. Any country can actually explore orbit and beyond. There can be no claim for sovereignty in space. No dangerous weapons are allowed in orbit and beyond. The moon, the other planets of our solar system, and other celestial bodies can be used solely for peaceful purposes. Any astronaut from any country is considered an envoy of humanity, and all other nations that are the participants in the treaty have to provide them with all possible help when needed. It includes an emergency landing in a foreign country or at sea. Also, each of the countries that signed the agreement is in charge of its space activities and must provide constant supervision. And finally, nations are responsible for damage caused by their satellites and other space objects, and must prevent space contamination. Now, 
Even though nations can't lay claim to space and its resources, are there any constrictions determining who can keep stuff from space that landed on our planet? For example, in July 2022, space debris from SpaceX fell in a farmer's backyard in the snowy mountains. If this is the case, space junk must be returned to the country where it came from. But what if it was a meteorite carrying potentially valuable minerals? Specialists say that if this space traveler lands in your own backyard, as opposed to the property you rent, then you become the owner of this meteorite. But if you find the same meteorite on public land, you won't be able to keep it, because meteorites are classified as protected objects under the Protection of Movable Cultural Heritage Act, 1986. We finally know when Earth will cease to exist. It'll happen when the sun enters its red giant phase. Are we going to survive long enough to witness it all? Let's figure it out. In 5.4 billion years from now, our star, which is a yellow dwarf at the moment, will run out of hydrogen in its core. The sun's core will heat up and become denser, causing the star to grow in size and turn into a red giant. The expanding sun will get so huge that it'll encompass the orbits of Mercury, Venus, and probably Earth. Even if our planet survived being consumed on the spot, it'd still end up so close to the heat of the newly born red giant that it'd scorch our planet. No life would be able to survive there. At the same time, there might be another outcome. As the sun expands, Earth's orbit might change too. You see, when our star reaches the final stages of its stellar transformation, it will lose unimaginable amounts of mass through extremely powerful stellar winds. It'll keep growing and losing mass, making the planets of the solar system spiral outward. So can it help Earth escape its dooming grasp? According to astronomers' calculations, our planet will not survive the expansion of the Sun in any case. By the time our star reaches its largest radius, which is going to be 256 times its current size, It'll be down to a mere 67% of the mass it has now. And the expansion process will be very rapid. The sun will sweep through the inner solar system in only 5 million years. At one point, it'll enter a short helium burning phase, which will last around 130 million years. During this time, it will expand beyond the orbit of Mercury. After that, the sun will swallow Venus. By the time our star approaches Earth, it will be already losing as much as 8% of Earth's mass every year. Speaking of our planet's chances, we've got some kind of a good news, bad news situation on our hands. The bad news is that our planet won't be able to live through the expansion of the star. Even if Earth's orbit became 50% more distant from the sun than it is today, it'd still have no chance. The sun would engulf our planet even before reaching the peak of its red giant phase. After that, the star would still have half a million years and 0.25 AU to grow. Once Earth is inside the sun's atmosphere, it will start colliding with particles of gas. Its orbit will begin to decay, and the planet will spiral inward. If Earth was just a bit farther from the Sun right now, at 1.15 AU, it would survive the expansion phase of our star. But what can be considered good news in such a tragic situation? Well, long before the Sun enters this red giant phase, the habitable zone around it will be gone. The heat from the Sun will evaporate Earth's oceans, and solar radiation will blast away the hydrogen from the water. Devoid of its main source of life, Earth will eventually become molten. It doesn't sound like good news, that's true. But the upside of this situation is that humanity will be bound to leave our planet long before it gets swallowed by the sun. We just won't have a choice. Of course, we can't be sure that some other catastrophic event won't claim us before we have time to colonize some other world. An additional benefit of the changing boundaries of the sun's habitable zone might be the restructuring of the entire solar system. Even though Earth won't be in our star's habitable zone anymore, most of the outer solar system will be. This zone will stretch well into the Kuiper Belt, which means that the formerly icy worlds will melt and liquid water will appear beyond the orbit of Pluto. So maybe that's where our new home will lie. 
Greetings to all watching our video quiz. Today, we will be taking a fascinating journey through space. The questions will range from simple ones that can be answered quickly to challenging ones that will require some thought. Be focused and resourceful, and you will be able to pass the quiz and become true space experts. Which planet has the highest density? Jupiter, Earth, Venus, Mercury. The Earth's density is 5.52 grams per cubic centimeter. This is because the Earth is made up mostly of rocky materials, which have a high density. Which planet has 6,000 artificial satellites? Earth, Venus, Mars, Jupiter. These satellites are used for a variety of purposes, including telecommunications, navigation, surveillance, meteorology, space exploration, and more. What large astral body is closest to Earth? Mars, Polaris, Sun, Moon. This is too easy. Which planet was first discovered with a telescope? Moon, Uranus, Earth, Venus. Uranus was discovered in 1781 by English astronomer William Herschel. Uranus had been observed before Herschel, but it was mistaken for a star. On which planet can you find diamond rain? Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Uranus. In the upper layers of Uranus's atmosphere, the temperature is about minus 220 degrees Celsius. At this temperature, methane breaks down into hydrogen and carbon. As the temperature continues to drop and the pressure increases, the carbon forms diamond crystals. These crystals then fall to the planet's core under the force of gravity. What stars in the universe have a rotation speed of 600 revolutions per second? White dwarfs, red dwarfs, neutron, brown dwarfs. Pulsars are neutron stars that formed as a result of a supernova explosion. They spin so fast that they emit radiation in a beam. Which planet has the most moons? Earth, Saturn, Mars, Jupiter. Saturn has 82 confirmed moons, including the largest moons in the solar system, Titan, Rhea, and Enceladus. What phenomena keep planets in a stable orbit around the sun? Magnetic field, gravity, solar wind, inertia. The force of gravity between the sun and the planets keeps the planets in their orbits. What color is the sky on the moon? Orange, white, blue, black. The moon has no atmosphere, so there is nothing to scatter sunlight. This is why the sky on the moon appears black, even during the day. On which planet does wind speed exceed supersonic? Earth, Neptune, Jupiter, Mercury. The wind speed on Neptune is the fastest in the solar system. It can reach 2,400 kilometers per hour, which is twice the speed of sound. What protects Earth from meteors and solar radiation? Jupiter, gravity, atmosphere, Elon Musk. The Earth's atmosphere is a mixture of gases that absorb and scatter solar radiation. This protects the Earth from harmful ultraviolet radiation. The atmosphere also protects the Earth from meteors, breaking them up into smaller fragments. Which planets have rings? Jupiter, Neptune, Uranus. Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. Saturn's rings are the most famous. Jupiter's rings are much less bright and are made up of small dust particles and rock fragments. Uranus's rings are made up of many thin rings and have a bluish tint due to the presence of ice. Neptune's rings have a reddish tint due to the presence of organic compounds. Which star is closest to Earth? Betelgeuse. Polar, Sun, Alpha Centauri. This is again too easy. The trajectory of the planet's movement in space is orbit, Dirl, starburst, eclipse. That's right. What is the cause of the hexagon on Saturn? Magnetic field, gravitational influence of the Sun, wind, counterclockwise rotation of Saturn. The hexagon on Saturn is a giant atmospheric vortex. It has a hexagonal shape due to the specific movement of winds in the atmosphere. The hexagon has existed for billions of years and is one of the most stable atmospheric phenomena in the solar system. How many questions did you answer correctly? 
write in the comments. Space is an immense and enigmatic universe that holds many mysteries. We are only just beginning to explore it, and there are many more discoveries waiting for us. I hope you enjoyed our quiz. I wish you all the best in your future studies of space. How about a mysterious object that used to orbit between Mars and Jupiter? At one point in the early days of the solar system, it was destroyed by some catastrophic event. This space body is called Phaeton, and this planet is totally hypothetical. But some people believe that the debris the planet left behind could have formed the asteroid belt. If you like this kind of content, please give it a non-hypothetical like and subscribe. Your support is very important to us. Thank you. Now, at the start of the 19th century, people hadn't discovered the asteroid belt yet. But in 1801, one astronomer spotted the largest asteroid in our solar system, Ceres. At that time, it was believed that a planet was orbiting between Mars and Jupiter, and Ceres seemed to be a suitable candidate. But the next year, another astronomer discovered one more space object with a similar orbit. It was an asteroid that was later named Pallas. These discoveries made scientists conclude that these two objects could have been fragments of the very planet that had once been dwelling between Mars and Jupiter.